meeting will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare a recess at any time. We welcome everyone to today's hearing on the report of Special Counsel Robert Herr. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from the state of Wisconsin for the purpose of leading us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Pursuant to an agreement with the ranking member uh, Nadler and without objection, Chairman Comer and ranking member Raskin will be permitted to participate in today's hearing for the purposes of making opening statements and asking questions of the witness. They each will receive three minutes for an opening statement and five minutes to question <coughs> the witness. The chair now recognizes himself for an opening statement. Robert Herr was appointed special counsel on January 12th, 2023. He had a fundamental question to address. Did Joe Biden unlawfully retain classified information? The answer, yes, he did. Page one of Mr. Herr's report, he says this, our investigation uncovered evidence that President Biden willfully retained and disclosed classified materials after his vice presidency when he was a private citizen. He further writes, Mr. Biden willfully retained marked classified documents about Afghanistan and handwritten notes in his notebooks, which he stored in unsecure places in his home. Joe Biden kept classified information, and Joe Biden failed to store classified information properly. Mr. Herr made these determinations after interviewing 147 witnesses. He examined 7 million documents, including emails, text messages, photographs, videos, toll records, and other materials from both classified and unclassified sources. But there's more. He not only, Joe Biden not only kept information he wasn't allowed to keep, and he not only failed to secure that information properly, he also shared it with people he wasn't allowed to, who weren't allowed to see it. Shared that information with his ghostwriter. And remember, this is information that only individuals with a security clearance are supposed to see. Mr. Hur told us on page 200 of his report that it's the kind of information that, quote, risk serious damage to America's national security. And what did Joe Biden have to say about all this? What was his explanation? On page 94 of Mr. Hur's report, Joe Biden said he took his notebooks with him after his vice presidency because, quote, they're mine. And every president before me has done the same exact thing. Never mind the fact that he had never been president when he took this information. But what comes through is Joe Biden felt he was entitled. You can almost hear it. You can feel the arrogance in the statement. They're mine. But even with all that, Mr. Hurd chose not to bring charges because, quote, Mr. Biden would likely present himself to a jury as he did in our interview of him, as a sympathetic, well-meaning, elderly man with a poor memory. A forgetful old man who Mr. Hur said did not remember when he was vice president, forgetting on the first day of the interview when his, when his term ended, and forgetting on the second day of the interview when his term as vice president began. Mr. Hur produced a 345-page report, but in the end, it boils down to a few key facts. Joe Biden kept classified information. Joe Biden failed to properly secure classified information. And Joe Biden shared classified information with people he wasn't supposed to. Joe Biden broke the law. But because he's a forgetful old man who would appear sympathetic to a jury, Mr. Hur chose not to bring charges. Mr. Hur, we think it's important that you be able to respond to President Biden's response to your report. So we're gonna play a short video of Mr. Biden's press, President Biden's press conference after your report was released because there's things in this press conference that the President of the United States says that are directly contradicted by what you found in your report. So if we could play that video. Hey everybody. Good evening. Let me say a few things before I take your questions. 
As you know, the special counsel released his findings today about their look into my handling of classified documents. <clears throat> President Biden, something the special counsel said in his report is that one of the reasons you were not charged is because, in his description, you are a well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. I'm well-meaning, and I'm an elderly man, and I know what the hell I'm doing. I've been president, and I put this country back on its feet. I don't need his recommendation. It's How totally bad out. is your memory, and can you continue as president? My memory is so bad, I let you speak. That's, you, uh, that's, that's my memory. Your memory has gotten worse, Mr. No, president? Look, my memory is not good. My memory is fine. My memory, take a look at what I've done since I've become president. None of you thought I could pass any of the things I got passed. How'd that happen? You know, I guess I just forgot what was going on. Mr. Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, voters have concerns about your age. How are you going to assuage them? And do you fear that this report is only going to fuel further concerns about your age? Only by some of you. Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President Mr. we're about criminal Mr. liability Mr. today. Mr. Mr. If you take responsibility for at least being careless with classified material. I take responsibility for not having seen exactly what my staff was doing. There's, it goes in and points out things that appeared in my garage, things that came out of my home, things that were moved, were moved not by me, but my staff, but my staff. Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, for months when you were asked about your age, you would respond with the words, watch me. Many American people have been watching and they have expressed concerns about your age. That is your judgment. That is your judgment. That is not the judgment of the press. They express concerns about your mental acuity. They say that you are too old. Mr. President, in December, you told me that you believe there are many other Democrats who could defeat Donald Trump. So why does it have to be you now? Why, what is your answer to that question? Because I'm the most question? qualified person in this country to be President of the United States and finish the job I started. Do you believe that by confusing the names of world leaders? Thank you, everyone. I did not share classified information. I did not share it. With your ghostwriter. With my ghostwriter. I did not. Guarantee you did not. But the what special the, counsel said in well, the report no, that he did not say that. Okay. okay. He did but, not say that. But Mr. President, what other people? Let me okay, answer your question. The fact of the matter is what I didn't want repeated, I didn't want him to know, and I didn't read it to him, was I had written a long memorandum to President Obama why we should not be in, this, in Afghanistan. And I was of this, multiple pages. And so what I was referring to, I said classified, I should have said it was, should be private because it was a contact between the president and the vice president as to what was going on. That's what he was referring to. It was not classified information in that document. That was not classified. <laughs> When you look back at this incident, is there anything you would do differently now? And do you think that a special prosecutor should have been appointed in the first place in both of these cases? First of all, what I would have done is overseen the transfer of the material that was in my office, in my offices. I should have done that. If I go back, I didn't have the responsibility to that. That was my staff was supposed to do that, and they referenced that in the report. And my staff did not do it in the way that, for example, I didn't know how half the boxes got in my garage until I found out staff gathered them up, put them together, and took them to the garage in my home. And all the stuff that was in my home was in filing cabinets that were either locked or able to be locked. It was in my house. It wasn't out in, like, in Mar-a-Lago in a public place where, and none of it was high classified. Didn't have any of that red stuff on it. You know what I mean? Around the corners. None of that. And so I wish I had paid more attention to how the documents were being moved and where. I thought they were being moved to the archives. I thought all of it was being moved. That's what I thought. Now, what was the last part of your question? Whether a special counsel should have been appointed in this case and in the case of your rival president, former president. I think a special counsel should have been appointed. And the reason I think a special counsel should have been appointed is because I did not want to be in a position that they looked at Trump and weren't going to look at me, just like they looked at the vice president. And the fact is, they made a firm conclusion. I did not break the law, period. Thank you all very, very much.
The hostage negotiation. I'm of the view, as you know, that the conduct of the response in Gaza, in the Gaza Strip has been um, over the top. I think that, uh, as you know, initially, the president of Mexico, Sisi, did not want to open up the gate to allow humanitarian material to get in. I talked to him. I convinced him to open the gate, let them make them part of the Middle East and recognize them fully in return for certain things that the United States would commit to do. And the commitment to, that we were proposed to do related to two, uh, two, two items. I'm not going to go in detail, but one of them was to deal with uh, um, the protection against their arch enemy to the northwest, the northeast, I should say. The second one, by providing ammunition and material for them to defend themselves. Coincidentally, that's the time frame when this broke out. I have no proof what I'm about to say. But it's not unreasonable to suspect that the Hamas understood what was about to take place and wanted to break it up before it happened. Thank you, everybody. We're going to need everybody to hold for a moment. The gentleman yields back. The chair now recognizes the chairman of the Oversight Committee, Mr. Comer, for an opening statement. Thank you. In August 2022, President Biden questioned in a 60 Minutes interview how anyone can be that irresponsible when asked about classified documents in the possession of former President Trump. But when President Biden said this, he knew that he had stashed classified materials in several unsecured locations for years, dating back to his time as vice president and even as a U.S. senator. President Biden, the White House, and his personal attorneys have not been honest with the American people about his willful retention of classified material and continue to hide information from Congress. President Biden's attorneys claim to have first discovered classified material at Penn Biden Center on November 2nd, 2022. However, President Biden and his lawyers kept it secret from the American people before the midterm elections. CBS News broke the story in January 2023, leaving Americans to wonder if the White House had any intention of ever disclosing that President Biden hoarded classified documents for years. One of my first actions after becoming chairman of the House Oversight Committee was to launch an investigation into President Biden's mishandling of classified documents. This investigation started before special counsel Herr was named. And what we found is alarming. Information obtained through multiple transcribed interviews conducted by the Oversight Committee contradict the White House's and President Biden's personal attorney's narrative about the discovery of classified documents at the Penn Biden Center. In fact, the real timeline began in the spring of 2021, not November 2022, as the White House claimed. Additionally, the classified documents were not kept in a locked closet as asserted by the White House. We've also learned that five White House employees and a Department of Defense employee were involved in the early stages of coordinating the organizing, moving, and removing of boxes that were later found to contain classified materials. There's no reasonable explanation as to why so many White House employees were concerned with retrieving boxes they believed only contained personal documents and materials. Why did President Biden keep these specific documents in unsecure locations for years? Many questions remain, but now the White House is obstructing Congress as we seek the truth for the American people. We've subpoenaed former White House counsel Dana Remus to appear for a deposition to provide information to our committee, but the White House is seeking to block her testimony. We've also subpoenaed the Department of Justice for audio recordings and transcript of President Biden's interview with Special Counsel Herr. These were due the morning of the State of the Union. Only this morning, a couple of hours before today's hearing, the Department of Justice finally provided the transcript of President Biden's interview with Special Counsel Herr. The timing is not coincidental. Although we've had little time to review the transcripts from what we have seen, 
it is clear that the White House did not want Special Counsel Hur's final report to be released. The White House has refused to be transparent with the American people about the President's mishandling of classified documents. And worse, they have appeared to have lied about the timeline, about who handled the documents, and even about the contents of President Biden's interview with Special Counsel Hur. That is why today's hearing is important. Transparency is what we seek today, and we look forward to Special Counsel Hur's testimony. I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. Without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. We will now introduce today's witness. The Honorable Robert Hur was appointed as a special counsel in January 2023 to investigate the removal and retention of classified documents discovered at the Penn Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement. He previously served as the principal associate deputy attorney general at the Department of Justice and as the United States Attorney for the District of Maryland. He was a law clerk for Chief Justice William Rehnquist and also clerked for Judge Alex Kaczynski on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals. We welcome our witness and thank him for appearing today. We will begin by swearing you in. Mr. Herr, would you please stand? Raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, so help you God? Let the record reflect that the witness has answered in the affirmative. Uh, thank you, and you can be seated. Please know that your written testimony will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, we ask that you summarize your testimony. Mr. Hur, you, you may begin with your opening statement. Make sure you got that, make sure you got that mic on, if you could, Mr. Hur. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman Jordan, Ranking Member Nadler, Chairman Comer, Ranking Member Raskin, members of the committee, good morning. I'm privileged to have served our country for the majority of my career, a decade and a half, most of those years with the Department of Justice. I have served as a line prosecutor, a supervisor, the principal associate deputy attorney general, a United States attorney, and a special counsel. I've served in these roles with gratitude as the son of immigrants to this country, the first member of my family to be born here. My parents grew up in Korea and were young children during the Korean War. My father remembers being hungry and grateful for the food that American GIs shared with him and his siblings. My mother fled what is now North Korea in her own mother's arms, heading south to safety. My parents eventually met, married, and came to the US, seeking a better life for themselves and for their children. Their lives and mine would have been very different were it not for this country. No matter the role, no matter the administration, I have applied the same standards and the same impartiality. My respect for the Justice Department and my commitment to this country are why I agreed to serve as special counsel when asked by the Attorney General. I resolved to do the work as I did all my work for the department, fairly, thoroughly, and professionally, with close attention to the policies and practices that govern department prosecutors. My team and I conducted a thorough, independent investigation. We identified evidence that the President willfully retained classified materials after the end of his vice presidency when he was a private citizen. This evidence included an audio recorded conversation during which, during which Mr. Biden told his ghostwriter that he had, quote, just found all the classified stuff downstairs, end quote. When Mr. Biden said this, he was a private citizen speaking to his ghostwriter in his private rental home in Virginia. We also identified other recorded conversations during which Mr. Biden read classified information aloud to his ghostwriter. We did not, however, identify evidence that rose to the level of proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Because the evidence fell short of that standard, I declined to recommend criminal charges against Mr. Biden. The department's regulations required me to write a confidential report explaining my decision to the attorney general. I understood that my explanation about this case had to include rigorous, detailed, and thorough analysis. In other words, I needed to show my work, just as I would expect any prosecutor to show his or her work explaining the decision to prosecute or not. The need to show my work was especially strong here. The Attorney General had appointed me to investigate the actions of the Attorney General's boss, the sitting President of the United States. I knew that for my decision to be credible, I could not simply announce that I recommended no criminal charges and leave it at that. I needed to explain why. 
My report reflects my best effort to explain why I declined to recommend charging President Biden. I analyzed the evidence as prosecutors routinely do by assessing its strengths and weaknesses, including by anticipating the ways in which the president's defense lawyers might poke holes in the government's case if there were a trial and seek to persuade jurors that the government could not prove his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. There has been a lot of attention paid to language in the report about the president's memory, so let me say a few words about that. My task was to determine whether the president retained or disclosed national defense information willfully. That means knowingly and with the intent to do something the law forbids. I could not make that determination without assessing the president's state of mind. For that reason, I had to consider the president's memory and overall mental state and how a jury likely would perceive his memory and mental state in a criminal trial. These are the types of issues that prosecutors analyze every day. And because these issues were important to my ultimate decision, I had to include a discussion of them in my report to the Attorney General. The evidence and the President himself put his memory squarely at issue. We interviewed the President and asked him about his recorded statement. Quote, I just found all the classified stuff downstairs, end quote. He told us that he didn't remember saying that to his ghostwriter. He also said he didn't remember finding any classified material in his home after his vice presidency. And he didn't remember anything about how classified documents about Afghanistan made their way into his garage. My assessment in the report about the relevance of the president's memory was necessary and accurate and fair. Most importantly, what I wrote is what I believe the evidence shows and what I expect jurors would perceive and believe. I did not sanitize my explanation, nor did I disparage the president unfairly. I explained to the Attorney General my decision and the reasons for it. That's what I was required to do. I took the same approach when I compared the evidence regarding President Biden to the department's allegations against former President Trump. There, too, I called it like I saw it. As a prosecutor, I had to consider relevant precedents and to explain why different facts justify different outcomes. That is what I did in my report. I'm confident the analysis set forth in chapters 11, 12, and 13 of my report provides a thorough evaluation and explanation of the evidence, and I encourage everyone to read it to inform their opinions of the report. Prosecutors rarely write public reports or testify about their investigations. That is the Justice Department's longstanding policy, and it protects important interests. My team and I prepared the report to the Attorney General with care, and the report stands as the primary source of information. My responses today will be limited to clarifying information for the committee. I will refrain from speculating or commenting on areas outside the scope of the investigation, nor will I discuss what investigative steps we did or did not take beyond what's in the report. In conclusion, I want to express my heartfelt thanks to the attorneys, agents, analysts, and professional staff who helped us do our work fairly, thoroughly, and independently. I am grateful and privileged to have served with them. I single out for particular thanks Deputy Special Counsel Mark Crickbaum, a former United States attorney himself who brought great wisdom, skill, and judgment to our task. Thank you. I welcome your questions. Thank you, Mr. Hur. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from North Dakota for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. How could that possibly happen? How could anyone be that irresponsible? And I thought, what data was in there that could compromise sources, methods, and it's just totally irresponsible? That was President Biden's statement about Donald Trump and the classified documents. Now, Mr. Hur, classified documents were found at the Penn Biden Center? That's correct. They were found in President Biden's garage? In Wilmington, Delaware, yes. And in his basement den? Also in the same home, yes. In, the major, in his main floor office? Correct. And his third floor den? Correct. At the University of Delaware? Correct. And at the Biden Institute? Correct. All right. And the elements of the crime for this, I mean, we, can't, we get into all of this, but the elements of the crime are pretty simple, right? The president, or president Biden had under, unauthorized possession of a document, writing, or note. That's correct. Correct. And that the document, writing, or note related to national defense. Correct. 
and that the defendant, and we may talk about the willfully part here in a second, retained the document, writing, or note, and failed to deliver it to an employee or officer entitled to receive it. Correct. There is a willfulness intent element, as you say. And, but those are the elements of the crime. Uh, including the intent element, yes. Yeah. And there are at least two different quotes, right, where he told his gross writer, and this is in your report, in a matter of fact, and this is February 16, 2017, that he had just found all this classified stuff downstairs. He did make that statement that was captured on an audio recording. And on April 10th, 2017, Biden read aloud a classified passage related to a 2015 meeting in the Situation Room. That is in the report, yes. And these are national security documents, Afghanistan, I mean, has been mentioned a whole bunch of those things, right? Correct. And at one point in time, his personal attorneys and the DOJ attorneys argued about notes, taking all of the different things and compared it to Reagan. I'm sorry, could you repeat that, Congressman? President Biden's attorneys, personal attorneys, talked about uh, the notes and why they didn't actually ac account for the Presidential Records Act. But you, d I mean, you found that argument I, in your report. It seems a little persuasive, but you eventually said, no, the executive order trumps, right? We did, conduct, we did set forth an analysis of the governing law and ultimately concluded that the executive order 13526 does apply and did govern pre former Vice President Biden at the time. So you have audio recording from his ghostwriter where the president acknowledges that the information he has is classified and he's sharing with his ghostwriter. We have an audio recording capturing a statement from Mr. Biden saying to his ghostwriter in February of 2017, Quote, I just found all the classified stuff downstairs, end quote. And then again, reciting passages from a meeting in the Situation Room. Yes. And those are in President Biden's own words. Correct. Right, so he's, a, and the ghostwriter has no classified, no, he, he has no cl clearance, no classified clearance to anything, correct? That is our understanding that Mr. Zwanitzer was not authorized to receive classified information. Okay, so the elements are possessed documents, the documents related to national defense and willfully retain those documents and in this case shared them with somebody who was not allowed to receive them. There are different subsections of 18 U.S.C. 793. One subsection relates to the willful retention and another relates to disclosure of national defense information. Well, I mean, the willful retention. We've got the Penn Biden Center, the garage, the basement den, the main floor office, the third floor den, the University of Delaware and the Biden Institute. We have 50-year career of a person who has not been very great at dealing with classified documents throughout, even prior to his time as vice president, when he was in the U.S. Senate, right? We do address each set of those documents in the report, Congressman. So the difference, but I think this is really important because the difference is it appears just from reading the report, he has been, and we heard all about exonerated and all of those different things. It appears from the report, he met every actual element of the crime. So I want to talk about uh, the department principles on federal prosecution. Because that actually has nothing to do with the underlying elements, correct? It's whether or not you can prove this at trial. Under the department's uh, justice manual and the principles of federal prosecution, a prosecutor has to assess the evidence and determine whether in his or her judgment, the likely, uh, the probable outcome will be a conviction at trial. So whether or not you meet the elements of the crime, which I think it's clear that he does, the second part of this is this, and that's where it gets into the sympathetic, well-meaning, elderly man with a poor memory. You could have just said we don't prosecute uh, sitting presidents, but you did not, and you entered this. But that doesn't have anything to do with the actual elements of the crime. That has to do with getting a conviction at trial, correct? Well, Congressman, um, part and parcel of a prosecutor's judgment as to whether or not a conviction is the probable outcome of trial is assessing how the evidence identified during the investigation lines up with the elements and what proof can be offered to a jury during a trial. Sure, but his well-meaning elderly old man has nothing to do with the underlying elements of the crime. Well, it, it certainly has it's a something. presentation to the jury. It certainly has something. Back. Tell me can respond. It, it certainly has something to do with the way that a jury is going to perceive and receive and consider and conclu make conclusions based on evidence at trial, Congressman. Gentleman yields back. The gentleman from uh, Mr. McClintock, gentleman from California, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Hur. I first want to get this straight. Is it now okay if I uh, take home top secret documents, store them in my garage, and read portions of them to, to friends or associates? Congressman, I, I wouldn't recommend it, but I don't want to entertain any hypotheticals at this well, point. Was it okay? I mean, I, I can do that now under this new doctrine. 
again, Congressman, I, I wouldn't recommend that you do that, but um, well, I don't you, wanna... you've, you, you, you've essentially said so in your report, uh, and, and certainly it would be exculpatory if I, if I simply told you, hey, I'm, I'm getting old, I don't remember stuff the way I used to. Congressman, I, I'm not here to get into hypotheticals, I'm here to talk about the facts and the work that I did. It was the, not a hypothetical, this is the mm -hmm. issue at hand. Uh, you, you, you correctly noted in your report that uh, former presidents and other senior officials have been given wide latitude in their possession of classified information, and I believe your decision to, to pro not to prosecute Biden uh, for the same offense is, is consistent with that precedent. But the, the problem is that precedent changed with the administration's decision to prosecute Donald Trump. And the irony is that as president, Trump had full discretion over handling uh, classified material and, and full discretion in deciding which records to retain. As a senator or vice president, Joe Biden didn't have that. So now we get to this glaring double standard. I think it would be toxic to the rule of law on its face if it was just two ordinary citizens. But the fact that the only person being prosecuted for this offense happens to be the president's political opponent makes this an unprecedented assault on our democracy. This is the worst we could expect from a banana republic. And I wonder how you square this. Congressman, I do address, as I was required to as a prosecutor, uh, a relevant precedent in the form of the alleged, the allegations and the indictment against former President Trump. I, I set forth my explanation and my assessment and comparison of those precedents in my report, and I, I am not here to comment any further be, uh, well, beyond well, what's in my you, report. Well, you, you said, for example, that, that um, uh, 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 there, there was no evidence beyond reasonable doubt. Well, you got the fact that he had classified material in his possession and control in multiple settings for multiple years, that he told others he was aware of this, and that he shared that material with others. The mind boggles at what beyond reasonable doubt would actually mean. Well, as I set forth in, at length in my uh, explanations in chapters 11 and 12 of the report, my assessment is that the evidence, if presented at trial, alongside potential defense arguments, would not probably result in a conviction at well, trial. Well, that's one of the points you make, is that President Biden's likely to be an elderly, sympathetic uh, a figure with a poor memory. But how does that bear on any individual's guilt or innocence? Isn't that, again, a question for a judge or jury to decide after guilt or innocence is, is, is determined? It is. Uh, and, and again, here's the problem. Donald Trump's being prosecuted for exactly the same act that you've documented that Joe Biden committed. Congressman, uh, if I understood your question correctly, you said, isn't that a question for a jury? And it most certainly, in the, through the lens well, of my My, my question is, does that bear on the guilt or innocence of an individual? It certainly bears on how a jury is going to receive and perceive and make decisions. So the answer to my evidence. earlier question is correct. All I have to do when I'm caught taking home uh, classified materials to say, I I'm sorry, Mr. Herbert, but I'm getting old. My memory's not so great. Yeah. Congressman, I, Th this I is the doctrine that you've established in our laws now, and it's frightening. Congressman, my intent is certainly not to establish any sort of doctrine. I had a particular task. I have a particular set of evidence to consider and make a judgment with respect to one particular set of evidence, and that is what I did. Well, Mr. Herr, here's, here's the fine point of the matter. The, the foundation of our justice system is equal justice under law. That's what gives the law uh, its, its respect and its legitimacy. And, and without it, the law is simply force, devoid of any moral authority. Justice is depicted as blindfolded for, for this very reason. It doesn't matter who comes before her, all are treated equally. You destroy this foundation, and the rule of law becomes a sick mockery. It becomes a weapon to wield against political rivals and a tool of despotism. And I am desperately afraid that uh, this decision of the Department of Justice is, is now crossed a, a very bright line. And I yield back. Mr. Herr, why did he do it? Why did Joe Biden, in your words, willfully retain and disclose classified materials? I mean, he knew the law. Been in office like 50 years, five decades in the United States Senate, chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, eight years as vice president. He got briefed every day as vice president. He's been in the Situation Room. In fact, you know he knew the rules. 
because you said so on page 226. President Biden was deeply familiar with the measures taken to safeguard classified documents. And Joe Biden told us he knew the rules. Mr. Armstrong said this earlier. Joe Biden was deeply familiar with it. You're exactly right, because he told us when Jack Smith goes after President Trump, Joe Biden says, how could this happen? What data was in those documents that could compromise sources and methods? It's irresponsible. So Joe Biden knew the rules. You know he knew the rules. And Joe Biden told us he knew the rules. So Mr. Hur, why did he break them? Congressman, the conclusion uh, as to exactly why uh, the president did what he did is not one that we explicitly address in the report. The report explains my decision uh, to the attorney general that no criminal charges were warranted in this manner. I think you did tell us. I think you told us, Mr. Hur. Page 231, you said this. President Biden had strong motivations. That's a key word. We're getting to motive now. President Biden had strong motivations to ignore the proper procedures for safeguarding the classified information in his notebooks. Why did he have strong motivations? Because, next word, because he decided months before leaving office to write a book. To write a book, that was his motive. He knew the rules, he broke them because he was writing a book. And you further say, and he began meeting with the ghostwriter while he was still vice president. There's the motive. Mr. Hur, how much did President Biden get paid for his book? Off the top of my head, I'm not sure if that information appears in the report. It sure does. There's a dollar amount in there. You remember? I, I don't, it, it may be eight million if eight that's Eight million added. dollars. Joe Biden had eight million reasons to break the rules took classified information and shared it with the guy who was writing the book. That's why he did. He knew the rules, but he broke them for $8 million in a book advance. But you know what? It wasn't just the money. Joe Biden, here's this, this page 231, very next page. Joe Biden, in your report, Joe Biden viewed his notebooks as an irreplaceable, contemporaneous record of the most important moments of his vice presidency. He had written this all down for the book for the $8 million. And the next thing you say in your report is, quote, such a record would buttress his legacy as a world leader. You know what this is? It wasn't just the money, it wasn't just $8 million, it was also his ego. Pride and money is why he knowingly violated the rules. The oldest motives in the book, pride and money. You agree with that, Mr. Hur? You wrote it in your report. That language, and it does appear in the report, and we did identify evidence supporting those, uh, those assessments. You also had another interesting statement in your report. You said Joe Biden, I want to make sure I get this right, viewed himself as a man of presidential timber. Remember that statement, Mr. Hur? I believe that does appear in the report, at least in the executive summary. I think this is interesting, because here's the scary part. Page 200. I said this earlier in my opening statement. Page 200, Joe Biden... This is a quote, Joe Biden risked serious damage to America's national security when he shared information with his ghostwriter. Shared it with his ghostwriter, the guy who was helping Joe Biden get $8 million. And oh, by the way, Mr. Hur, what did that ghostwriter do with the information Joe Biden shared with him on his laptop? What did he do after you were named special counsel? Chairman, if you're referring to the audio recordings that Mr. Zwanitzer created of his conversations with exactly Biden, what I'm referring to, he he, uh, he slid, if I remember correctly, uh, he slid those files into his uh, recycle bin on his computer. Tried to tried to destroy the evidence, didn't he? Correct. The very guy who was helping Joe Biden get the eight million dollars, eight million dollars, Joe Biden used w w the motive for Joe Biden to to disclose classified information, to retain classified information, which he definitely knew was against the law. When you get named special counsel, what's that guy do? He destroys the evidence. That's the key takeaway in my mind. That's the key takeaway. I yield back. The uh, chairman of the Oversight Committee, Mr. Comer, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. During the Oversight Committee interviews, we've identified a number of White House employees who were involved in the mishandling of classified documents under the leadership of President Biden. Uh, Special Counsel Hurd, can you please tell us approximately how many current and former White House employees you interviewed related to your investigation? 
Chairman Comer, I, I don't have that figure immediately ha at hand. Um, of course, it was a subset of the 173 interviews that we conducted during our investigation. Y your report indicates that one of those former White House employees who you interviewed was Dana Remus. Is that correct? We did uh, interview Ms. Remus. M Ms. Remus was President Biden's former White House counsel, correct? Uh, she was um, President Obama's former White House counsel. Or, I'm sorry, President Obama's White House counsel. Yes. Related to Ms. Remus, in your report on page 257, you wrote, in May 2022, White House counsel Dana Remus undertook an effort to retrieve Mr. Biden's files from the Penn Biden Center. Remus described the original purpose of that effort as gathering materials to prepare for potential congressional inquiries about the Biden family's activities during the period from 2017 to 2019. Now, it seems odd to me that Dana Remus and Joe Biden's personal lawyers were obtaining documents related to potential congressional inquiries about the Biden family activities when Joe Biden has publicly claimed he had no involvement with his family's business dealings. Can you provide more information about why Dana Remus, a government employee, was retrieving Joe Biden's documents from the Penn Biden Center? Chairman, I'm, I'm able to tell you and clarify information that appears in the report about relevant significant sources of information, but I, I am not in a position to be able to go beyond that. When you interviewed President Biden, did you ask him what documents he possessed at Penn Biden Center that could be related to a potential congressional inquiry about his family's activities? We asked President Biden a wealth of questions about all of the different sets of classified materials that were recovered during the course of our investigation. Did anything pertain specifically to our congressional inquiry of President Biden that you recall? Uh, if there are more specific aspects of it that you have in mind, Chairman, that would be helpful to me. Interest pertaining to his family's uh, influence peddling activities? Um, if, if it's helpful, Chairman, um, Appendix A does list um, a, a, in, a, in table chart form a brief description of all of the marked classified documents that were recovered in our investigation. We intend to interview Ms. Remus, and the recording or transcript of your interview would be uh, highly relevant to our future questioning of her. Can you confirm that you did, in fact, record her in your interview? It, it was our practice to record the interviews that we conducted, Chairman Gomer. Additionally, in the course of the investigation, the Oversight Committee learned from a Penn Biden Center employee that Annie uh, Tomasini a White House employee visited the Penn Biden Center in 2021. Did you interview Annie uh, Tomanasini Tom in the course of your investigation? Uh, Chairman, we do not, the, the report does not reflect that specific name, but okay. what I can tell you is that the report does reflect that we uh, interviewed the Director of Oval Office Operations, okay. and, and one of the places that's reflected is footnote 973. Okay. The Oversight Committee interviewed Kathy Chung, a Department of Defense employee and former assistant vice to Vice President Biden and learned that Ms. Chung visited the Biden Penn Center in June 2022 after being contacted by White House counsel in May 2022. This was months before classified documents were allegedly found in November 2022. Did you interview Kathy Chung in the course of your investigation? Chairman, I, I believe that the, the substance uh, uh, relating to the subject that you're asking about appears on page 259 of the report. And while the name Kathy Chung does not appear in the text of the report, there are references to interviews of an executive assistant, including at footnote 988. Good. The Oversight Committee also learned from its interviews with Penn Biden Center employees and Kathy Chung that Dana Remus, Anthony Bernal, and Ashley Williams, all at the time White House employees, then visited the Penn Biden Center on different occasions before the alleged discovery of classified materials in November 2022. Did you interview these individuals during your investigation? We, we interviewed um, many individuals, and we, I can assure you, Chairman, that we, um, it was a priority of ours to interview all the relevant sources of information about these documents, how they got there, who knew about them, and who accessed them. Can, can you, so again, they were all recorded, is that correct? So there would be recordings? The, these in, the, it was our practice to interview recordings, yes, sir. How many White House employees visited the Penn Biden Center before classified materials were reportedly discovered there in November 2022? I don't have According any, to the White House. Sir, I don't have an exact count um, of... How, how many visits involved? to the Penn Biden Center were made by either White House employees or President Biden's personal attorneys before the official discovery of documents in November 2022? I don't have that figure at hand, but that should be detailed in Chapter 14 of the report, sir. I yield back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida. Five minutes. February 8th, the White House. Question, Mr. President, why did you share 
classified information with your ghostwriter, the president. I did not share classified information. I did not share it. I guarantee I did not. That's not true, is it, Mr. Herr? That is inconsistent with the findings based on the evidence in, in my report. Yeah, so it's a lie. It's just what regular people would say, right? <laughs> yeah, all right. So the next one. And all the stuff that was in my home was in filing cabinets that were either locked or able to be locked. That wasn't true either, was it? That was inconsistent with the findings of our investigation. Another lie, people might say, right? Because what you put in your report was, among the places Mr. Biden's lawyers found classified documents in the garage was a damaged open box. So here's what I'm, what I'm understanding, right? As Mr. Armstrong laid out, you find in your report that the elements of a federal criminal violation are met. But then you apply this senile cooperator theory, that because Joe Biden cooperated and the elevator doesn't go to the top floor, you don't think you get a conviction. And I actually think you get to the right answer in that. I don't think Biden should have been charged. don't think Trump should have been charged. But under the, like, the senile cooperator theory, isn't it frustrating that Biden continues to go out and lie about the basic facts of the report that lay out a federal criminal violation? Congressman, I need to disagree with at least one thing that you said, which is that I found that the, the, all of the elements were met. One of the elements of the relevant mishandling statute is the intent element, and what my report reflects is my judgment that based on the evidence, I would not be able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt to a jury that that intent element had been Right, met. but the reason you have that doubt is the, is the senile cooperator theory, the fact that Joe Biden is so inept in responding that you can't prove the intent, which again, I don't quibble with that conclusion, but it's frustrating to be like, oh, well, this guy's not getting treated the same way as Trump because the elevator's not going to the top floor, so we can't prove intent, while at the same time, Biden goes out there at the White House and says, well, you know, he just, he just, he just blatantly lies. And what I'm trying to figure out is whether or not Biden's lying because he's still so senile, he hasn't read your report, or whether it's a little craftier and a little more devious and perhaps a little more intentional than we might otherwise think. So I also want to go to this Biden Penn Center. Like, did, you, did it give concern to you that the Biden Penn Center, where all this classified stuff was being mishandled, was being floated by foreign governments? Congressman, we were concerned with getting to the bottom of all of the classified documents that were recovered during the course of yeah, our- Yeah, but the, like, what bothers me is that the <laughs> money that was paying for the place where the documents were being inappropriately held, it was the Chinese and it was other foreign countries. Did, did that play into your analysis? Did you, did you look into the billion dollars in foreign funding sources at the Biden Center at UPenn, for example? Congressman, we conducted a thorough, impartial, and fair investigation, and we were very, very concerned with getting to the bottom of all the relevant questions relating to the recovered Sir, documents. did you look into the fact that the Chinese were floating the place where this guy was keeping the documents unsecure? Yes or no? Congressman, to the extent that we identified evidence that was relevant and significant to our investigation, we put it in our report. Okay, well, it seemed relevant to me, maybe not to you. Another thing that seemed relevant to me is this ghostwriter, right? So the ghostwriter, purposefully deletes this evidence that seems to be like show culpability of Biden's crimes and you don't charge him. Why did you not charge the ghostwriter with obstructing justice and deleting evidence? Well, for a number of reasons that are laid out in the report, but in brief, Congressman, yes, uh, when, we, when we interviewed the ghostwriter, he did tell us, and I'm trying to get the exact language, that one of the things on his mind, one of the things he was aware of, was that I had been appointed special counsel and was conducting an investigation. Right, so, so, so he didn't, just so everybody knows, the ghostwriter didn't delete the recordings just as a matter of happenstance. Ghostwriter has recordings of Biden making admissions of, of, of crimes. He then learns that you've been appointed. He then deletes the information that is the evidence, and you don't charge him. That is reflected in the report, and one of the reasons... Like, what does somebody have to do to get charged with obstruction of justice by you? If, if, like, deleting the evidence of crimes doesn't count, what would meet the standard? So, Congressman, as we, as we uh, state in the relevant chapter of the report, one of the things that Mr. Zwanitzer did not delete was transcripts of the recordings that he had created that included inculpatory evidence relating to Mr. Biden. Oh, so if you, if you destroy some evidence but not other evidence that somehow absolves you of the evidence you destroy? He, like, here's what I see. Zwaniger should have been charged, wasn't. Biden and Trump should have been treated equally, they weren't, and that is the double standard that I think a lot of Americans are concerned about. I see my time's expired, I yield back. Gentleman from California is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Mr. Herr, I'd like to start off by, by thanking you for a year of hard work and a comprehensive report. Uh, I'm going to try not to provide testimony, as some people on both sides are, or provide conclusions, but I do have some questions that lead me to, uh, to ask you for conclusions. Uh, one question is, uh, are, were there notes of the, uh, of the President of the United States that dated back to when he was a senator? that contain classified information? Uh, among the documents that were recovered during our investigation were uh, marked classified documents that dated back to when Mr. Okay. Biden was a senator. When he was in his 30s, 40s, 50s. I believe that's correct. Uh, and uh, were there uh, documents from the time that he was vice president? Yes. OK. Uh, so there's been a lot to do about, you know, senility, non-senility, poor memory and so on. Uh, but let's just go through something that you deal with as a prosecutor every day. You first start off with a set of initial evidence that indicates there may have been a crime. Is that right? It, by the time it gets to you, usually you have some evidence that there may have been a crime. I think, I think that is fair, yes. Okay, and in this case, uh, at some point during this investigation, where the elements of the crime, including willfulness, uh, were put before you and you reached a personal conclusion that either there was likely guilt or not. Is that correct? Not provable, not, not in front of a jury, just personal, because you have to make that decision as part of the case, correct? Correct, and I would say it, I approach the task as I have been trained to as a prosecutor, which is as on an iterative basis. The investigation okay. is always uncovering so, new evidence that you incorporate. Right, so both before, during, and at the end, did you reach a conclusion, notwithstanding his current mental uh, state of being an elderly man with a poor memory and so on, that, that he did in fact deliberately take documents and held them from back when he was a senator uh, that, that, and we're talking about your personal, not that you could prove it, but personally, did you see a pattern that goes all the way back to him being a senator of taking documents, making notes, and taking them and holding them personally? Congressman, I viewed my task as a prosecutor in this matter to determine what I believed the evidence. No, I appreciate that, and, and I'm not trying to take away from your conclusion. Some others are debating the conclusion. I'm not debating the conclusion. I just want to go through uh, one element that I think is important. Look, you, you've prosecuted people in the past and failed to get a conviction. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, you're not a 1,000 perfect batting average. Okay. I can't say that. Yeah. So you went into cases thinking that you would succeed and you didn't. Uh, one might say you probably declined to prosecute ones that you might have either gotten a conviction or gotten a plea on, would you say that's fair to say over your long career? I think that's fair because I take the rules as set forth in the Justice okay. Manual seriously. However, uh, I'm going to presume that you would never prosecute someone you thought was outright innocent. Correct. In this case, did you reach a conclusion that this man was outright innocent? That conclusion is not reflected in my report, sir. Right. So you did not reach that conclusion, or it would have been in your report. I viewed my task of explaining my decision to the Attorney General as being, based on my judgment and my assessment right. of the evidence, would a, would a conviction at trial be the probable outcome? And, that's and, and, and I, I just want to make sure the record is complete in that, because I think it's extremely important. You did not reach an idea that he had committed no wrong. You reached a conclusion that you would not prevail at trial and therefore did not take it forward. Is that correct? Correct, Congressman. Okay. Uh, I just want to go through one or two little, these are housekeeping almost. Uh, the documents uh, that the, pres the, vice pr the president, then vice president, took, which included his own notes, uh, to your knowledge, aren't those covered by the Freedom of Information Act? Potentially. I honestly do not know, Congressman. Aren't they covered by the uh, uh, Presidential Records Act as every note and every text of the president, the vice president, and members of the cabinet are covered? I think different folks would have different views on whether they're covered by the PRA, Congressman. 
But isn't it true that he left office leaving none, no copies of that behind, and that alone was inconsistent with an open and transparent uh, individual, correct? I'm not aware of copies of those materials being left behind, Congressman. Okay, I want to thank you, and Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you for the extra few seconds. Okay. I yield back. Congressman, I reject the suggestions well, me, that you let, have just well, made. Well, that is well, not what me, happened. Let me move on. Partisan then, politics sir, you are, you no are a part member, whatsoever in you my are, work. You are a my member of the Federalist Society, are you not? And fair. Are you a member of the Federalist Society? I am not a member of the Federalist Society. But you are a Republican, though, aren't you? I am a registered Republican. Yes, sir. And you're doing everything you can do to get President Trump reelected so that you can get appointed as a federal judge or perhaps to another position in the Department of Justice. Isn't that correct? Congressman, I have no such aspirations, I can assure you. And I can tell you that partisan politics had no place whatsoever in my work. It had no place in the investigative steps that I took. It had no place in the decision that I made. And it had no place in a single word of my report. Thank you, gentlemen, sir. Ge gentlemen's time has expired. The ge gentleman from New Jersey is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Hurst, thank you for being here. You know, I think for the folks that may be watching this at home, they might be a little bit confused, and I'm trying to organize this in my mind as well. Um, the way the pr president is portrayed in your report and just how we feel about him, was he a well-meaning, forgetful man, as you said, or was he a man that was focused on history? Was he a man that maintained and retained these uh, top secret documents that should have been in, not in his home? And was he a man that wanted to prove he was worthy to be president and that his vision of Afghanistan was better than even President Barack Obama's and that his focus on history was most important to him? Do you know which it is? Congressman, to the extent you're quoting language from my report, I stand by the words in my report. So you stand by that he was, and let me quote you exactly, quote, a well-meaning but forgetful old man. I don't think those exact words appear in the report, Congressman, but to the extent that I uh, use words similar to that effect in my assessment of how a jury would perceive Mr. Biden and the evidence relating to him, including his testimony, I do stand by that assessment. So is it accurate to say that in your interview, President Biden retained and disclosed classified materials as a means to bolster his image as a presidential figure? And I'm asking you for yes or no's here because our time is so limited. I believe words to that effect are in my report, Congressman. So the answer is yes. Would you agree that President Biden's intent to showcase his legacy provides a motive for his actions concerning classified materials? Yes it or is, no? It is one of the motives uh, addressed in the report. Yep, to showcase his legacy. Is it accurate to quote your report that classified documents were found in, quote, badly damaged boxes in his garage near a collapsed dog crate, a dog bed, a Zappos box, and an empty bucket? Is that correct? Those words do appear in the report. So that's correct. The answer is yes. Are these secure locations to store classified documents? They are not. Okay, so we got a former vice president who is established to have willfully, purposefully retained classified documents in order to highlight his political stature and show his stature as a presidential figure. We have a former vice president who stored classified documents in very unsecured places. We have a former vice president who will not suffer any consequences for all of these actions, all because we say, well, he's a well-meaning, forgetful old man. You know, if you were kind of a well-meaning, forgetful old man that was driving a car and you forgot what you were doing a little bit and you hit somebody and killed him, I believe you'd be responsible. The law must apply, you know this, to everyone. The standard behind the decision not to prosecute Joe Biden, especially in light of special counsel Jack Smith's decision to prosecute President Trump for similar conduct, gives the real appearance of two standards. Just again, so much part of this Department of Justice. Justice for thee, but not for me. Special Counsel Her, has any former president or vice president besides President Trump ever been criminally charged for knowingly retaining classified information after they left office, yes or no? No. Would you concur that Special Counsel Smith's decision to charge a former president for retaining and disclosing classified information was an extraordinary unusual and unprecedented decision. 
I will not comment on that matter. Well, I'm going to comment. The answer is yes. Special Counsel Hur, these two reports are the culmination, in my mind, of the Department of Justice's two standards, two standards, and an example, again, of the Justice Department being weaponized against conservatives. You know, there's another piece to this, too, while I have just a few seconds. Um, we know that when his ghostwriter was speaking to him, he also did recordings, and when he did those recordings, it was clear, in fact, I'll try to quote this here, it was a month in 2017, a month after Biden left his VP, he was aware of top secret classified materials that were, quote, downstairs. Is that true? That is reflected in an audio recording, yes. It's reflected in an audio recording, you know. So sometimes he may be sleepy, sometimes he may be forgetful, sometimes he may be cognitively impaired. There's no doubt about that. But man, when it came to his personal legacy, the way he wanted to be remembered, to be sure that he was a big deal in plain English in the future, he was willingly and knowingly breaking the law. And it's unfortunate that we have a Department of Justice that will treat one person one way and somebody else a different way. It's a sad day for America. Thank you, Mr. Hurd. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Hurd, for being here. And thank you for your report. I've re read it. Um, and I think where you and I might have disagreements, there may be matters of opinion and not necessarily the facts as you've reported them. So I want to I want to go over uh, the elements of the offense that seem to have at least struck my cries is the, the where you put in here twice that the jury would not find not likely to find intentionality on the part of uh, of disclosure in particular. So I want to talk about that for a second. So so if it's not willful, we might say an accident, uh, something neg negligent, careless that would not necessarily rise to willful or intentional or, or purposeful, right? Those are different standards of intent under the law. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, um, so when, when President Biden misplaced 30 briefing documents in 2010 that had classified material, and, in, and they're not sure even if they ever got them all back, or when he was in the Hamptons part, at a party and he <clears throat> lost what they were calling code words, which is uh, high security information, that, that wasn't necessarily willful. There was no indication that he purposefully did that. Accidental, negligent. You indicated, don't know if we even got all that information back. We're assuming maybe we did. That, that would not be willful, right? As reflected in the report, there were certain categories of documents where when we looked into them and investigated um, how they got to where they ended up, or how they ended up being misplaced, we did not identify evidence of willfulness. Yeah, and so if something's willful, you wouldn't say it's ignorant, it's not incompetent, it's not accidental. Um, we'd say something like it's willful, it's intentional, it's purposeful. It indicates really a choice, that you have made a deliberate, conscious decision to, uh, to act in a certain way. Is that fair? That, that is fair, Congressman. And as I explained in the report, the standard, um, the, the willfulness standard, basically involves, can be boiled down to the following things, that you know that what you are doing is against the law and when you do it. Correct. So let's take a look at it. And this has been brought up before in February of 2017. Um, he's having the discussion with the ghostwriter. He says, he's at the Virginia House at this point. He says, I just found all the classified stuff downstairs, right? So he knows he's got classified stuff, right? Two months later, in April, He's at a different location, is my understanding. I think, he's in, I think he's now up in Delaware. And as you look at page, let's look at 105, 106 here. He says, uh, Biden reads from a different notebook entry. He reads aloud from notes summarizing a range of issues. We're talking about US military views expressed there by the intelligence community, the DNI, CIA director. And while he's reading those notes, he says, I can't, I can't read my own writing. Do you have any idea what the heck I'm saying here? The, he asked the, the, the uh, ghostwriter, the ghostwriter says, well, something, blah, blah, blah. And Biden says this, some of this may be classified, so be careful. Some of this may be classified, so be careful. Now, my immediate response was, okay, so he knows he's got classified docs. He's looking at this. He can't read it. He's, he's, he's giving this to somebody he knows to has no security clearance. So he says, hey, 
read this, but be careful. It might be classified. The next thing, and the guy says, okay. Next thing he says, well, I don't know if it's classified or not. I'm suggesting to you, and this is the diff- where you and I have a difference of opinion. When you say something like, hey, I just, uh, uh, look, this may be classified. Be careful. That warning, that warning to be, clar- be careful because it may be classified, that indicates guilty knowledge. That indicates he might know something more than he otherwise would have. And it indicates, then they go on and they read it. As you point out here, he reads classified information. And it's still classified today. That's on page 106. So when you look at this, it's hard for me to say, well, he was ignorant. He was incompetent. He was accidental. No. He had guilty knowledge. He knew and told the guy that he's going to expose that classified material to, hey, be careful. Be careful. It may be classified. That indicates something a little bit more than mere knowledge. Indicates that he has some intent there. Because the next thing he should have said is, hey, I don't know if it's classified, but we're going to skip over this until that's resolved. He didn't do that. What he said is, read it anyway. Yield back. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from North Carolina. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Herr, I'm way down here in the, at the end of the dais. Um, I think today the Justice Department released the transcripts of the interviews with President Biden. Are you aware of that? Uh, I understand that to be true, yes. Uh, did you have any involvement in the, re- in the decision or the timing of the release of the transcripts? No, Congress. Did you make any recommendation about the release of the transcripts or being done or not? I did not. That was above my pay grade. Yeah, I, I don't know why they've been released so close to this hearing, but it sort of uh, it, it impacts our ability to evaluate your report and ask you questions about it. So, but there's one point, just as an illustration, on 221 of your report, uh, you're describing, I think, uh, this, the Afghan pack or something like that about in 2009, I think, is the information came from. And, and you say, um, uh, as one reason not to prosecute, Mr. Biden says, in addition, Mr. Biden told us in his interview that he does not recognize the marking confidential as a classification marking. To him, the marking means the document should be held in confidence, but not necessarily that it is classified. And footnote 866 is a reference, and it refers to the Biden 10-9-23 transcript at 24 and 25. Now, we have that now, but we haven't until this morning. But uh, I just want to read from that exchange. This is on page 24 at line 15. Mr. Crickbaum, so this is a typewritten document. It's got a confidential, what appears to be a stamp at the top. And the top of the document indicates it's from the American AM Embassy, Kabul. It's dated what appears to me to be November 09. The only question I have for you about this, Mr. President, is the confidential marking. Do you recognize that to be a classification marking? President Biden, no. I mean, confidential doesn't want to get around. It's not in a category, I don't think, of code word, top secret, that kind of thing, but I don't even know where it came from. Mr. Crickbaum, are you familiar with confidential as a level of classified information. President Biden, well, if I got a document that said confidential, it means it would mean that no one else could see it but me, and you give it, or the people working on this issue. Mr. Crickbaum, and are you aware that among certain categories of classified information, there is top secret, secret, and there's also a category of classified information called confidential. Is that something that you are aware of or not? President Biden, I, yes, I was aware of it. I don't ever remember when I got any document that was confidential that was meant for me to read and or discuss with the people who sent me the memo, so. And that's the, and then it trails off. So as I read that, those answers, they're equivocal. He at first says, he doesn't know, do you recognize that to be a classification marking? He said, no, and then goes on to explain. But then Mr. Crickbaum came back and he said, are you aware that among certain categories of classified information, 
There's also a category of classified information called confidential, and he says, I, yes, I was aware of it. So, Mr. Hurd, just in that one instance, there seems to be a discrepancy between the conclusion in the report or the summary of the evidence in the report and what the transcript says. Can you offer any guidance to this committee why you would put that uh, summary in your report as opposed to saying that he gave inconsistent answers, or in fact, why didn't you nail down in the transcript which was the right answer? He's given answers that says no, and then he says yes. Why didn't you pursue it until you knew? Congressman, the report reflects our best efforts to summarize and characterize the evidence in the investigation, including the investigation we received from the president himself during our interview of him. Um, but as you point out, the transcripts of the president's interview over two days are now available to the committee for their inspection, and um, the members are able to draw their own conclusions uh, based on the transcripts that are now available to them. Well, with all, uh, and I appreciate your answer. Uh, and I certainly think uh, things, you know, you can come up with some details that someone can disagree on, and it has the quality, I know, of some, of some cherry picking because I've just found something, but we've only had a little bit of time to look. I don't think it serves this process well for the Justice Department to dump these transcripts into the public right now. If they were going to be released, they should have been released at a proper time. Um, and, I, and, and I think I'll leave it at that, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. The gentleman yield? The gentleman yield? I will yield just, to the just, chairman. Just real quick, Mr. Hurd, someone earlier said, you know, said something about changing the facts. You said, I'm not going to change the facts. But let's keep the facts the same but change the subject. If you had the same facts and the individual that you were investigating was 65 and had a good memory, do you reach the same conclusion? Congressman, as I responded earlier to a question along these lines, I am not here to entertain hypotheticals about facts or circumstances that may be different. What I did was assess the evidence and the facts that I obtained in this investigation and make a judgment based on this set of evidence. The lady from Indiana is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I just thank you, Special Counsel, for being here in these challenging times. And I want to tell you a few things that is interesting for me. Uh, you obviously could see that there is a motive, there is a legacy. You obviously see that it was a willful retention of these documents, but it's interesting for me that when you talk about sympathetic, well-meaning, uh, older man with poor, uh, elderly man with a poor memory, it seems like every you know, attorney would advise you to be sympathetic and be well-meaning, and it seems like the whole FBI needs to do a, a based on my hearings here, I need to do check on amnesia because everyone says doesn't recall. So it seems to me that it might have been something way more in his recollection than a typical I don't recall because that's what everything's like that's what I've learned it here. So is there even something more than that, that just I don't recall something for you to actually decide? Because it seems that this is the core of, of the whole investigation. Why didn't you pursue for, further the charges? Congresswoman, uh, my judgment um, as to how a jury would likely perceive and receive and consider evidence relating to um, relating to all the evidence that would be put in both by both the government and the defense at trial, um, it was based on a number of different sources, from documents, including various recordings, some of them from the 2016-2017 timeframe, some from our interview with the president in October of 2023. I think what you're asking about specifically is how the president presented himself during his interview in October of last year. And of course, I did take into account not just the words from the cold record of the transcript, but the entire manner in, in living color in real time of how the president presented himself during his interview. Uh, hopefully he didn't outsmart you and all of us. But uh, uh, before I yield, I just wanted to actually just comment on something, you know, Mr. Raskin mentioned about, you know, us not remem remembering communists. I actually grew up under communists, and I have a very good recollection what it is. And unfortunately, Tyrion's eye on the, on the rise, on the march, which he said, unfortunately, they've been emboldened by, you know, President Obama, now by President Biden, too. And unfortunately, our government in the Department of Justice is really now resentful Examples, you know, a tyrannical government, it's sad for me to see that, but I'm going, and with a really double standard what we have there, but uh, I'm going to yield to Chairman Jordan the rest of my time. Thank the gentlelady for yielding. Uh, Mr. Hurd, during your one-year investigation, did you have communications with the White House and the White House Council in, in particular? Yes. I think you had, like, I, I got five letters that they, uh, in, in, and they communicated with you regarding your investigation. Is that accurate? We received a number of letters from uh, White House Counsel's Office and as well as the President's personal counsel. Right, they're either special counsel or, or personal counsel. I see the, who signed the letters. And did the White House get the report before the report was made public? 
We did provide a draft of the report to the White House Counsel's Office and members of the President's personal counsel team for their re review. No, I understand. And did the White House then, once they got the report before it went public, did the White House try to weigh in with, with your investigation on elements of that report and, frankly, get the report changed? They did request certain edits and changes to the draft report. Yeah, I see that in the, in the February 5th letter. Did they only correspond with you? I'm sorry, Congressman, are you, are you asking if they, Congress, if they corresponded with anyone else on my team? Once you gave the report to the White House, yes. they, tried to, they saw changes. I have one letter here that's addressed to you on February 5th, and they said, we're pleased that after more of a year of investigating, you've determined, you know, they, 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 they respond to the report. And then they, they ask, they, they disagree with your, uh, they ask for you to change some of the things you had in your report, namely the fact that the president's uh, memory was uh, not very good. You remember that? Yes, sir. Okay, but I also have two other letters, one on February 7th to Merrick Garland, where they raise the same concern, and then on February 12th, where they go to the DAG, Bradley we uh, Weinsheimer. You familiar with those? Uh, I am familiar with those letters. Bradley Weinsheimer is an assistant uh, or associate deputy attorney general. Right, associate DAG, the ADAG, right? Yes. And Merrick Garland, of course, is the attorney general. So yes, you're familiar with the fact that they went over your head? Um, they were certainly entitled to write whatever letters they wished to Mr. Weinsheimer and to the Attorney General. I just find that interesting. You know, the White House is, they're communicating with you throughout this one-year investigation, and then the White House says, oh, we're going we're gonna go to the, we're gonna go to the principal's office and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about Mr. Hur's report. Do you find that interesting? Uh, as I said, they, they were free to correspond with whomever in the federal government they wished to correspond with. Um, I, I did engage in numerous communications with them during the course of the uh, investigation. And as is reflected in the special counsel regulations, the attorney general did provide oversight of my investigation. I'm from Wisconsin, is recognized for five minutes. <laughs> yeah, I, I just want to go uh, do a little repetition, Mr. Hur, in regards to the chairman's questions from a few minutes ago. So is it correct that on uh, that February 5th letter uh, that was sent to you asking you to change um, uh, references to the president's poor memory, wasn't there a request by the White House to do that? There was a request, yes. And Mr. Chairman, I think the record should show that the gentleman from Maryland earlier said that that was not, uh, that was not the case. I think he said, uh, nor did he seek to redact a single word of Hur's report. Obviously, Mr. Hur is telling us differently here. And didn't the White House then um, go to the Attorney General himself and say that he would like to see changes to the references in regards to the President's memory? White House counsel did send such a letter. So if, um, um, if this president was 60 years old rather than 80 years old, um, would you prosecute him? Congressman, as I've said before, I, I cannot engage in hypotheticals. I address the facts and the evidence as I found so them in there this There was matter. an 80-year-old grandma <coughs> that came to Washington, D.C. a few years ago, did not commit a violent crime, committed a crime, but did not commit a violent crime, and she was fully prosecuted. Doesn't that seem like it's a dual system of justice where the president is above the law? Congressman, I don't know the facts and the details of this other case that you're referencing with this other person. You say that um, the president is unlikely to reoffend in the future. I believe that was a quote that you put in the report. Is that correct? I believe that's in Chapter 13. How, how so? How is he unlikely to reoffend in the future? How, how, how do you come to that judgment? Uh, as I say on page 254, any deterrent effect of prosecution would likely be slight. We are not concerned with specific deterrence. As we see little risk, he will reoffend. Well, isn't it because he's now the president and he has almost unlimited authority to, um, uh, to release documents? Isn't that correct? I mean, under, as a vice president, he didn't have that authority. Now that he's president, isn't it easy to say that, that he's unlikely to reoffend because he's got almost unlimited authority? to release these documents? Well, that, that statement was based on that assessment of the likeliness of reoffending from this particular person, President Biden, is based on a number of factors, including the authority that he has now with respect to classified materials, as well as the experience that he's had going through a special counsel investigation. Yeah, but look at back at 2011, there were multiple instances where he was informed by his staff and they ratcheted it up to where there was a formal process. You're saying he's learned from that when he's proven that he hasn't? I mean, that goes all the way back to 2011. 
Congressman, what I'm saying in the report at page 254 is that- He's a repeat offender, Mr. Herr, isn't he? What I say- Let me move on to, I'll move on to something else here. You said he had strong motivations to ignore the proper procedures for safeguarding classified information. And he provided raw material to his ghostwriter that would be of interest to prospective readers and buyers of his book. And I think you said something about, he viewed himself as a historic figure, correct? I believe those words do all appear in the report. Yeah, and he was also doing this for business purposes, um, that there may be people that would want to buy his book. Towards the end of his vice presidency, Mr. Biden had resolved to write a book and began work on it uh, towards the end of his vice presidency. You know, I think, Mr. Chairman, this is really consistent with the Biden family when you look at them in trying to enrich themselves. I mean, you're familiar with the work that the Oversight Committee has done over the last year, right? I have read some reports of it. I mean, 20 phone calls that were made to his son that he denied in 2019, 20 shell companies that were created, over $20 million. I mean, doesn't it appear there's a pattern here that where I come from, they almost call it money grubbing. Congressman, what I'm here to testify about today is the work that I conducted in this investigation and in this report. So I want to thank you for the work that you did as far as you could. But um, unfortunately, you are part of the Praetorian Guard that guards the swamp out here in Washington, D.C., protecting the elites. And Joe Biden is part of that company of the elites. And you see it in um, the things that the Department of Justice has not acted on, Mr. Chairman. I mean, you look at the president's son, who does not have to answer for lying on his Form 4473 in regards to throwing away a weapon. You see it where the uh, Department of Justice fends off the IRS when the whistleblowers come with this information. And now we see it once again, where a president believes he is above the law. And there is no doubt that this president does believe he's above the law. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman from Wisconsin is recognized. Attorney Herr, um, Webster's dictionary defines senile as exhibiting a decline of cognitive ability, such as memory associated with old age. Mr. Herr, based on your report, did you find that the president was senile? I did not. That, that conclusion does not appear in my report, Congressman. You felt, though, that the president's memory or lack thereof was a critical reason to decline prosecution. The reason I'm asking this is whether you believe the president would be fit to stand trial, or do you think his lawyers would argue his incompetence to stand trial due to his state of mind? Uh, also, you know, was, was he in a, in a place to actually uh, be questioned? Congressman, my report, to the extent that it addresses um, the president's memory gaps that we identified and the evidence that we obtained during our investigation, they are addressed in the context of determining how the jury would perceive, receive, and consider evidence relating to um, whether or not the president had willful intent when it came to retaining or disclosing national defense information. Very good. I'd like to focus my questioning on Chapter 14 of your report. Uh, the classified documents found at the Penn Biden Center. Uh, you state in your report that the documents found at the Penn Biden Center were the most highly classified, sensitive, and compartmentalized materials recovered during your investigation. Is that correct? That is correct. Many of the documents came from Mr. Biden's West Wing office. That's also correct, isn't it? I believe that is reflected in the report. Uh, do you, did you ask if he had packed the boxes himself? I believe that was one of the questions that we asked and that is reflected in the transcript now available to the committee. I think it's important. How would you characterize the packing of these boxes? Was it slow and meticulous or were they packed in haste uh, without much scrutiny at all? I, I don't recall off the top of my head exactly how we characterize it, but I, I think the, the gist of the evidence is that um, the manner in which files were packed up and moved out at the end of the Obama administration was in a, um, it was in some, something of a rushed manner. Very good. According to your report, the boxes were moved between multiple offices between Mr. Biden departing his West Wing office in January of 17 and his arrival at the Penn Biden Center's permanent offices in October of 17. Were any of these offices authorized to store classified information? No. When the boxes finally arrived at the Penn Biden Center's permanent offices, uh, how were they stored? 
I believe when the materials were recovered, uh, some of them were stored in a storage closet. Um, and, and I believe others of them were in file cabinet drawers. So but what's I, your assessment, I would refer you to the report. What's your assessment on security and access control measures at the Penn Biden Center? That was something that we looked at. There were some security access controls at the Penn Biden Center, but we did get a handle on people who had access to the office space during the time period when we believed the materials were there. And there were other people, including students and some foreign dignitaries that visited uh, that facility at the time. Very good, you anticipated my next question. So when the boxes were discovered to have classified documents more than five years later, uh, who, who discovered these boxes? It was Patrick Moore, is that correct? Correct, one of the president's personal counsel. And did Mr. Moore have some type of active security clearance at the time? No. How about the executive assistant at the Penn Biden Center? No. On page 265 of your Actually, report. Actually, I'm sorry, Congressman, I may have misspoken there. I, I am not certain whether or not that executive assistant had an active security clearance at the time. Very good, on page 265 of your report, you stated, when interviewed by FBI agents, Moore believed the small closet was initially locked and that the Penn Biden Center staff member provided a key to unlock it, but his memory was fuzzy on that point. Uh, but an interview with Mr. Biden's executive assistant seemed to contradict his statement. D do you remember this exchange, and did, did in fact it contradict each other? Sir, you're, you're asking if I remember the exchange with um, Mr. Moore during our interview of him? Uh, right, do you, remember the, do you remember them contradicting each other? I don't remember that contradiction specifically, but um, generally during the interview, sometimes we heard things from some witnesses that were in tension with what we heard from other witnesses, and we did our best to resolve those, uh, co those conflicts. Just very quickly, in total, National Archives discovered nine documents totaling 44 pages with classification markings, is that correct? From the Penn Biden Center, yes. And you declined charges because in, in summarizing your analysis, you couldn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that retention of the documents was willful. Correct, sir. Very good, I yield back. Gentleman from Oregon is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I was quite interested in the dates that are set forth in your report, Mr. Hur, and uh, the reason I'm interested is because I keep getting confused between the 2017 date and the 2024 date as to the condition of the of president's memory. And so was there a difference? Because when I look at it, it seems like his memory was bad in 2000. 17, and then it was bad today. But there's never any distinction made. But isn't it true that if you were going to be looking at his, at, at prosecuting as you were, you would look carefully at his condition in 2017? Isn't that the proper time? Because I think you say in your report that the most, uh, the, your best case, I think you call it out, um, the best case for charges would rely on Mr. Biden's possession of Afghanistan documents in his Virginia home in February 2017 when he was a private citizen and when he told his ghostwriter he just found classified material. That's the best case as you say it. Yes. And then you work your way through a series of, of defenses against your best case. So it was, you were looking at his condition in 2017. Do I have that right? You, you do, Congressman. And his memory was bad then. Uh, what's in his, we can make, draw our conclusions whether it improved over the, the next six years or not. But I just want to make sure it's clear that we're looking at his condition in 2017, which you then find as you go through the def, kind of the, the list of defenses that is his memory is bad, his memory is bad, his memory is bad. There's about six or seven defenses here. And so what, what it gets me to is, is this question. Um, and, and I actually pulled this quote out of um, something I read this, this morning, uh, that perhaps your report concluded, and perhaps it did not, that the president is, quote, incapable of being held accountable. But that's not quite what happened, is it? You didn't find that he was incapable of being held accountable, did you? I did not. Those you words did not. do not appear in my report. They do not. But you reached a conclusion that you didn't have the evidence, but then your, your report continually recites these defenses. And I'm having a hard time putting the two together. If you didn't have the evidence, why do you persist in reciting these defenses? Congressman, I, I wrote my report as an explanation of my decision to decline charges as to President Biden. 
And the way that I came up with that explanation and wrote it in my report for the Attorney General is the following. The approach that I took was a prosecutor envisioning what would be the probable outcome of trial if we charged this case, if we presented the evidence to a jury, and not only the government presenting the evidence to a jury, but what would happen if the defense lawyers also got a chance to try to poke holes in the government's case at trial. And with respect to one of the several potential defenses that I lay out in the report, one of them does focus on the president's memory-related issues. That is a defense that the president's defense lawyers may well present at trial. And a jury is going to be confronted with at least three separate sets of evidence relating to the president's memory. One is from the recordings in 2016 and 2017 from the Ghost Rider. But if I, for, forgive me for interrupting, but I'm, I'm limited on time as everybody else was. But you say, I think, that the evidence uh, suggests he is incapable of forming or you're incapable of proving uh, intent. It, there's kind of a bit of a difference there, uh, right? You, you may well have had the intent, but you could not pr of, of, of uh, holding these, these documents and I hate to say hiding the documents, but you, can't, you couldn't prove it. So what you did instead is fell back to the various defenses that might also be asserted against you. Kind of a, a heap of rationale for not pursuing the president. Is that, is that, do I have it right now? Congressman, I think we're on the same page. I think what I'm trying to convey is that the way that prosecutors assess the strengths and weaknesses of their case is to think through, hey, in the government's case in chief, here's the evidence we're gonna, we're gonna present. And the jury might be with us. Maybe, maybe but, another, but that's another. not the end of the trial. The trial also has to include presentation from the defense you, lawyers. You are, you're correct, and I'm a lawyer. I've tried cases, so I get it. That your report is not an exoneration so much as a determination that the evidence as you saw it would not overcome the defenses that you had identified, uh, plus uh, whatever lack of evidence you perceived. So it's not an exoneration, is it? The word exoneration does not appear anywhere in my report, and that is not my conclusion. The, the, other, the other thing that's of interest, and I think you were misquoted, um, you, you said something about, or someone, uh, I think it was Mr. Raskin, uh, suggested that you, um, well, I'm gonna run out of time, but um, I, appreciate, I appreciate the work you do as a prosecutor and uh, I yield back. Can you question. explain what specifically in your interview with President Biden led you to this conclusion? The conclusion um, that about broad how statement that's been cited many times. Mm. The, the totality of the time that I spent um, with the president during his voluntary interview um, was something that I certainly uh, considered in, in framing my assessment and articulating it in the report. And that includes not only the words in the cold record of the transcript of the interview, but also the experience of being there in the room with him and frankly, considering how he would present to a jury in a criminal trial if charges were brought. And I guess I'm asking specifically, I know you cite in the report he, the, the dates that he couldn't remember when he was vice president, when he began, when his term ended. You cite that in the report. Is there anything else specifically that stands out from that interview with the president? A number of things stand out. Um, and again, I, I'm aware that the transcript has now been made available. Um, I, I do provide certain examples in my report of uh, significant, personally painful experiences um, about which the president was unable to, to recall certain information. Um, I also took into account the president's overall demeanor in um, interacting with me during the five plus hour voluntary interview. So it was a, a wealth of details about being there in the moment with the president, uh, including his inability to recall certain things. And I'll also say, as reflected in the transcript, um, the fact that he was prompted on numerous occasions by the members of the White House Counsel's Office. I read office. that. What the brief, the brief look I had at the transcript this morning, because we just got it this morning, I, I, I saw some of that. Chair now recognizes Mr. Kiley. Mr. Herr, why did the White House ask you to remove parts of the report? What was the reason they gave for that? I don't have the letter in front of me, Congressman. Uh, I believed that among uh, their reasons was that they contested or that they they asserted that certain language in the report was inconsistent with DOJ policy. The day that your uh, report came out, the president gave a, uh, a live uh, news conference on national television. Did you watch that uh, news conference? I watched the press conference, yes. What was your reaction to seeing the president uh, personally attack you and your team? 
Congressman, I'm here to talk about the work that went into the report and my declination decision and my explanation of it for the attorney. And it wasn't just the president. Uh, Anthony Coley, former spokesman for Merrick Garland, uh, has said that Democrats should focus their ire on her. Uh, the president's personal attorney, Bob Bauer, said that your report, report is a shabby piece of work and a shoddy work product. Do you agree with that characterization of your report? I disagree ve vehemently with that characterization of my report. I also disagree. I think it's very well written, uh, well considered, uh, and comprehensive. Do you think it's appropriate for the administration to be attacking the work of a special counsel that it appointed itself? Congressman, I'm not going to comment on the propriety of the administration's reaction to my report. What I can tell you is that I stand by the report and the work that went into it. Today, the ranking member started his opening statement by saying, Mr. Herr completely exonerated President Biden and called your report a total and complete exoneration. Mr. Herr, did you completely exonerate President Biden? That is not what my report does. Was your report a total and complete exoneration? That is not what the report says. So the statement by the ranking member was incorrect, yes? Um, as I said, the, the report is not an exon exoneration. That word does not appear in my report. Based on the facts and anticipation of defenses presented in your report, could a reasonable juror have voted to convict? As I said in the report, some reasonable jurors may have reached the inferences that the government would present in its case in chief. So a reasonable juror could have voted to convict based on the facts that you presented? Correct. If you were on the jury, would you have voted to convict? Uh, I have not engaged in that thought exercise, Congressman, and so what I'd like to stick to is what's in the report, which is my assessment as a prosecutor. Sure. And what you did find uh, in the report is that the president, uh, you said this is page 200, risks serious damage to America's national security through his handling uh, and mishandling of classified materials. And you identify, quote, a strong motive for the way he handled those materials. Uh, two of the motives you cited was his desire to run for president and his desire to sell books. So a reasonable inference for your report is that the president risked serious damage to America's national security in order to make money and advance his personal political ambitions. Is that correct? The report includes a description of the evidence and um, different inferences that reasonable jurors could draw from the evidence. And you also uh, note that the president described his predecessor's handling of classified materials as totally irresponsible, and your report concludes that Mr. Biden's emphatic and unqualified conclusion that keeping marked classified do documents unsecured in one's home is totally irresponsible applies equally to his own decision. Is that correct? That language does appear in the report. You cite as a mitigating factor uh, the fact that the president uh, cooperated in the investigation. But at the time that the investigation was happening and these acts of cooperation occurred, the Mar-a-Lago investigation was already a matter of public record, correct? I believe that's correct. So we already had a public debate about the handling of classified documents and the potential application of the criminal laws to that general set of circumstances. I think that's fair. And so the president, when he decided to cooperate or not cooperate, had to know that that decision to cooperate or not cooperate would become known to the public and he would be judged according, accordingly. Is that correct? I'm not in a position to opine on what was or was not in the president. But it's relevant to your analysis as to whether or not it counts as a mitigating factor. If he knew that he was going to have to be judged based on whether he cooperated or not, that would lessen its value as a mitigating factor. So did that, in your analysis, lessen its value? We, we undertook a uh, comprehensive assessment. So that, that specific factor, did it lessen its value as a mitigating factor? That and all facts relating to uh, the president's cooperation with our investigation. Another factor you discuss is deterrence. And you say that deterrence actually, the factor actually counsels against uh, bringing charges here because you said, as for general deterrence, future presidents and vice presidents are already likely to be deterred by the multiple recent criminal investigations and one prosecution of current and former president and vice presidents for mishandling classified documents. So that one prosecution, of course, is the indictment brought by Jack Smith. So by the very terms of your analysis, Jack Smith's indictment actually counseled against and was accounted against bringing charges in this case. Is that correct? I'm sorry, Congressman. I don't follow your, your drift. There. Well, you said that there's already deterrence because there's this prosecution out there in a prior case related to classified documents. So we don't need to bring another case to establish deterrent value. That's, that was the essence of your analysis, correct? Congressman, what, what I'll say is that I will stand by the, the, the way and the specific words in which I characterize my assessment of deterrence value of a, of a case under the principles of federal prosecution that's on page 254 and 255 of my report.
Thank you. My time is out, but I'll just add the perverse implication here is that the administration, by the very terms of your analysis, actually made it less likely that the president would face charges by Jack Smith bringing an indictment. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentlewoman from Wyoming is recognized. Special Counselor Herr, when you determined that no criminal charges should be brought against President Biden in this matter, you focused on the specific facts surrounding the classified documents where President Biden stored them and on his memory and age. You wrote that President Biden's, quote, memory was significantly limited during his recorded interviews with the ghostwriter in 2017 and during his interview with the special counsel's office in 2023. You also expressed concern that prospective jurors would be persuaded by President Biden's presentation as a sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. Your assessment, however, was focused on how President Biden would currently present to a jury if he stood trial. Is that correct? That was an element of my explanation to the Attorney General for my decision. It was not the only element. Okay. That wasn't my question, but it was one of the things that we were considering was his current state of mind, his current memory. Correct? One of the things that I considered would be how, if a trial, whenever a trial theoretically were to be held, how President Biden would present himself to the jury if he elected to testify. Okay. You did not compare President Biden's current memory or condition with his memory or condition when he was in the Senate or when he left the vice presidency and took the classified documents subject to your investigation. Is that right? Actually, I believe that's not correct, Congresswoman. One of the things that's in the, in the report is an assessment of um, the president's memory based on recordings from the 2016-2017 time frame, recordings of conversations between Mr. Biden and his ghostwriter, and comparing that with the president's memory that he exhibited during our interview of him in October of 2023. So there was a comparison there. Okay, so, but in, unless there was some issue undisclosed to the American people during his 50 years in office, you found that Mr. Biden fully understood his legal responsibility related to the handling of classified materials, which is why you concluded in your report that Mr. Biden, quote, willfully retained and disclosed classified materials after his vice presidency when he was a private citizen. You state that on page one, correct? I believe that what I stated on page one was that we identified evidence that Mr. Biden willfully retained classified information after the end of his vice presidency, but ultimately we concluded that the evidence was insufficient to warrant- I, I understand that. I, please listen to my question. What, what I'm getting at is that Mr. Biden fully understood that he could not keep, keep classified information at his home as both a former senator and vice president. Isn't that right? He understood that, correct? My understanding is that based on the evidence, um, my assessment was that a, a jury... That isn't what my question was. Please listen to my question. My question was that Mr. Biden understood when he was a senator and vice president that he could not keep classified materials at his home, at his garage, and in other offices. Is that fair? I don't think that's accurate, Congresswoman, because when Mr. Biden was vice president, he was authorized to have classified material in his home. But after he left, he knew that he was not entitled to keep classified information at his home, correct? After he left, there is evidence to suggest that he knew that he could not legally have classified information at his home. However, there is evidence with respect to his notebooks that he believed he was authorized to keep the notebooks at home based on precedent. Based on precedent. You know, I, I guess the way that I would put it is this. Um, President Biden knew better. He knew that he wasn't entitled to keep these documents from the, when, when, he, when he was a senator, and he knew he wasn't entitled to keep these documents after he had left the vice presidency. But because he's now suffering from an impaired memory, as you so delicately put it, he got away with it. Is that fair? Congresswoman, what, what I stated in my, in my report is that there's certainly evidence that some jurors could, could infer to suggest that Mr. Biden willfully retained and disclosed national defense information. But in my judgment, the likely outcome of a trial, the probable outcome of a you trial, know, is not Herr, a conviction. You know, Mr. Herr, I have represented a variety of clients over the years in actions against the federal government over, in fact, several decades of time. It's been my experience that the federal government, the DOJ specifically, has essentially unlimited resources to go after and prosecute citizens and will spare absolutely no expense in doing so. 
It has also been my experience that the DOJ is not only overly aggressive in these cases, but makes it clear that part of the reason for such aggression is to make an example of the poor soul who is the subject of such action. In other words, so that other people will not engage in the same kind of conduct. Mr. Hur, having been a long-term DOJ prosecutor, can you please explain why those people without the last name of Clinton or Biden are typically treated quite differently and seem to be the only ones who are never held accountable for violating the law? Congresswoman, one of the things that I explain in my report is the fact that there are historical precedents with respect to former occupants of the White House and their retention of classified materials after they leave. So I'm asking specifically Gen about Mrs. Clinton General and Mrs. Expired. Hillary Clinton mm -hmm. and, and Joe Biden. Congresswoman, I, I don't have any um, opinion to articulate with respect to the investigation relating to Mrs. Clinton. I yield back. Without objection. Chair, now recognize the gentlelady from Florida, Ms. Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Special Counsel Her, for joining us here today to discuss your investigation uh, regarding President Biden's mishandling of classified documents. This has become an issue of great interest to all Americans and, of course, to all of us here today. As is outlined in your report, despite the discovery of confidential and top secret records located in the president's personal residence in Delaware, including in his garage, office, and basement, the department declined prosecution. And my colleagues' questions today have focused on the highlights from your report, specifically referring to President Biden's mental capacity, his willful disregard for the law as a private citizen, and how he would be perceived uh, if presented to a jury of his peers. Dependent upon, and I'll use your words from the report, how this sympathetic, well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory handled and managed the storage of these confidential documents, the national security of the United States might have been put at great risk because of the president's behavior. And so one of the things we must consider today is how we can ensure that our national security will not be continually put at risk when under the leadership of the same well-meaning elderly man with a poor memory. Since the release of the report, to your knowledge, has the Justice Department started to analyze a damage assessment of what may have been disclosed uh, by these documents being mishandled and any ongoing national security risks from the uh, inappropriate storage and retention of the documents? Congresswoman, my understanding is that such a damage assessment um is underway in coordination and cooperation with the members of the intelligence community. And do you today for us have any information about the status of that investigation or how long it might take to conclude? I do not, Congresswoman. I'd like to turn your attention to a discussion of the distinction between proving the underlying elements of an offense and the concept of an obstruction of justice charge. Uh, is it correct, Special Counsel Her, that in some circumstances as a federal prosecutor, you may investigate the underlying offense, an underlying offense, choose not to charge that offense, but still have developed sufficient evidence to charge a defendant with obstruction of justice. I think as a matter of law, theoretically, that could occur. Um, I can't bring to mind um, specific examples of that happening, but I suppose that if that were to happen, it would be a or difficult case to try from a prosecutor. Well, the elements are distinct, though, are they not? They are a distinct elements. And isn't it, uh, isn't it similar to a case where a federal prosecutor undergoes an investigation uh, and ultimately doesn't uh, pursue the original charge they were investigating, but during the course of the investigation concludes that a false statement was made to a federal law enforcement officer and, and brings a charge under 1001? That could happen. Yes. And, and the, again, there, too, the elements would be different. Correct. And in reaching your final decision related to the declination or the recommendation to decline prosecution, you considered both the underlying elements of the offenses at issue and also the principles of federal prosecution. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Now, the principles of federal prosecution, those are things that may vary case to case. Is that right? The determinations under the principles of federal prosecution are very fact and circumstance dependent. But the elements of the criminal offense are not. Isn't that also correct? Elements are defined by law, and um, they do not vary from case to case. And thus, those elements of the underlying criminal offense would be exactly the same from one defendant to the next to the next. Isn't that right? Yes. So you would expect, would you not, that a prosecutor who was considering the underlying offenses that you were considering here 
would be looking at exactly the same elements and requirements of proof that you did on the underlying charges. Prosecutors assessing their cases under the same statutes um, must consider the same elements with respect to those statutes. All right. Thank you, Special Counsel Her. And then if we could um, turn back to the concept of those uh, principles of federal prosecution, those are the additional factors, aggravating or mitigating, that you might consider in ultimately reaching a charge and decision here. Is that right? They do include such things that, that, that are referred to as aggravating and mitigating circumstances. There's one thing I want to go back to, though, to be clear. It's been said today that your report is tantamount to a total exoneration of President Biden. That's not correct, is it? That is not correct. All right. Thank you, sir. I so I'm going to start with uh, the gentleman from Kentucky is recognized. I yield to the chairman. I thank the gentleman for yielding. Mr. Hur, are you opposed to the U.S. Congress having access to the audio tapes of the people you interviewed during your investigation? Chairman, I, I am not in a position to articulate an opinion one way or the other. That is not really up to me. I'm a former employee of the Department of Justice. I would refer you to the White House and DOJ leadership. You're an accomplished lawyer. Is there any reason why we shouldn't, why the United States Congress shouldn't have access to the same information you had access to and that was the basis of your decision? Chairman, it is not for me to opine on what materials. Well, the Justice Department released the transcripts the day of the hearing. It'd be nice if we'd have had them at a more, I think, a better time for the committee to prepare for our questioning for you. They released them today. The White House and the Justice, Justice Department released them today. It'd be nice if we actually had the audio tapes, too. Again, is there any reason why you, you can see why the American people and their representatives in the United States Congress should not have access to those tapes? Chairman, what I can tell you is that my assessment um, that went into my conclusions uh, that I described in my report was based not solely on the transcript. It was based on all of the evidence, including the audio recordings. Great point, and that's where I was going. So this was valuable evidence for you as the special counsel named to investigate this issue, valuable evidence for you to reach your conclusion, and, and the statements you put in your report. And all I'm asking is, shouldn't the United States Congress have access to that same information? Chairman, again, it is not for me to weigh into what information Congress should or should not have, but what I will tell you is that the audio recordings were part of the evidence, of course, that I considered in coming to my conclusions. I will yield back to the gentleman from Kentucky and hopefully can yield to the gentleman from North Dakota. Yield to the gentleman from North Dakota. Thank you, Mr. Hearn. Chapter 8 of your book, or your report, you detail that Mr. Biden retained in his Delaware basement classified documents relating back to his time as a U.S. Senator in the 70s, correct? Correct. And even more Senate papers dating back to the 70s through 1991 were found in the University of Delaware, Morris Libraries, and in the Biden Senate Papers Collection, correct? Correct. And even more Senate papers dating back to the 1970s and 1980s were found in Biden's Delaware garage. I believe that's, yes, that's correct. And quote, Mr. Biden had nearly 50 years experience dealing with classified information, including as a member of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence, a member and chairman of the Senate Committee on Judiciary, a member and chairman of the Senate Committee on Foreign Relations, and Vice President of the United States, and that he was deeply familiar with the measures taken to safeguard classified information and the reasons for them, correct? That language certainly sounds familiar, Congressman, but if you have a page citation for me, I can confirm. And as, and as Vice President, is it correct that in 2011, Mr. Biden received advice from his staff about the need to secure classified information in the form of notes? Correct. Including his first counsel, or his first counsel Cynthia Hogan? Correct. And he was advised in writing in 2011 by Hogan that classified notes must be obtained in secure safes and stored in secure facility? Correct. His second counsel, John McGale, also advised Biden that all of Mr. Biden's records, including his notes, would be sent to the National Archives, and Biden understood and accepted that, correct? That's correct, with the exception that Mr. McGrail was uh, Vice President Biden's final counsel, not his second one. All right. And on his way out, Mr. Biden was also appraised of his obligations by the National Archives staff twice more that his classified notes should be secured in a skiff. That particular fact is not immediately coming to mind, Congressman, but um, if you have a, a page citation, I can confirm it for you. Well, did Mr. Biden have 30 years' experience handling this information? He received advice from at least two separate counsels, the National Archives staff. He has demonstrated enough knowledge of the law to attack, attack President Trump in public over the same exact issue in detail. This is where I get into this. It, I, I just have a problem with this. In your report, and this testimony, a reasonable person would conclude that Mr. Biden knowingly retained national defense information and failed to deliver it to an appropriate government official and that he knew his conduct was unlawful. 
And I think that's where we end up here, and that's what the point is. Over the last three election cycles, there's only been three people who have ran for president. Hillary Clinton, Joe Biden, Donald Trump. All three of them have been accused of mishandling classified documents. Only one of them has been prosecuted. And that's what the American people see. That's what we see. We had Hillary Clinton who ran a program called Bleach It on her server. They used hammers to destroy evidence. Joe Biden has a 50-year history of misplacing classified documents in numerous different position, places. All of these cases have the same underlying elements of the crime, the same fact patterns, and yet we only see one person being prosecuted. And with that, I yield back to the gentleman from Kentucky. When time's expired, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. Uh, the ranking members recognized for unanimous consent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, in, uh, in light of what the chairman previously said, I ask unanimous consent that uh, all transcribed interviews taken by the committee this year be made public. I recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Special Counsel Her, thank you uh, for a number of things. First, thank you for agreeing to testify today. Uh, second, thank you also for sharing your family's story at the beginning of your testimony. It is an extraordinary story of them coming to America. Uh, third, let me also thank you for your in-depth investigation and your detailed report and generally for your service as special counsel. It's not something that I think many people would look for and certainly uh, comes with a lot of burden. So thank you for your work. Uh, in your opening statement, you described your investigation as, quote, thorough and independent, and I agree with that. One where you attempted to give, quote, rigorous and detailed analysis, I also agree with that. And one where you say you, quote, must show your work, which we very much appreciate today. We don't normally see that. Did I recall your opening statement correctly as it relates to those quotes? Yes, sir, you do. In fact, as part of your investigation, you interviewed more, about 150 different witnesses. You, you looked at millions of different documents because you wanted to do a thorough investigation. Isn't that true? Correct. And you did this because you took your investigation extremely seriously and you wanted to reach accurate conclusions, correct? Very much. Then let's uh, review some of your specific findings regarding the the issues pertaining to competency and mental capacity uh, of President Biden. Because as you say, this is very important to whether or not there was criminal willful intent. As you can see, I've set forth a number of uh, different quotes up here on this board that I've prepared, some of which I'll read to you. Page five, you say Mr. Biden's quote, Mr. Biden's memory was significantly limited. Then again on page six, you say Mr. Biden would likely present himself to a jury as a sympathetic, well-meaning, elderly man with a poor memory. Then on page 207, you say, Mr. Biden's memory also appeared to have significant limitations. And then again on page 208, he did not remember when he was vice president, and he did not remember even, several, even within several years when his son Bo died. You finally make the statement on page 248, quote, for these jurors, Mr. Biden's apparent lapses and failures in February and April 2017 will likely appear consistent with the diminished capacities and faulty memory he showed. Uh, those were astounding conclusions to me. And as I look through those quotes, I have to say I hearken back to my time before con Congress. I was a judge, and one of the things that I oversaw was guardianships. And frankly, when I read your, when I read your conclusions, red flags began to go up in my mind because I oversaw hundreds of guardianships back in Texas. And as I saw your conclusions, I began to wonder, what does the D.C. statute say about guardianships and how you define an incapacitated individual in Washington, D.C.? And I want to show you this statute because I presume, are you familiar with the statute at all? I, I am not, Congressman. So I didn't think that you'd probably review that. So let me just read to you some of these, um, some of the, the definitions here. An adult who is, whose ability to receive and evaluate information effectively and to, or to communicate decisions is impaired to such an extent that he or she lacks the capacity to manage all or some of his financial resources. That's the first part of the definition of incapacity, an incapacitated individual under the guardianship statute in the District of Columbia. And quite frankly, I see tons of overlap from what you set forth in your uh, testimony and your written report and the definition here. The phrases are almost identical. I would posit that if he cannot manage national top secret resources, I'm not sure how he can manage his personal financial resources. 
and given your report's findings that his memory was, quote, significantly limited and that he is a person with, quote, diminished faculties and with, quote, fact, uh, faulty memory, it makes me wonder how close he is coming to meeting this definition of an incapacitated individual such that he should have a guardian appointed by the D.C. courts for his personhood. There is at least, I believe, a prima facie argument to say that there is su substantial evidence to indicate such. And you mentioned it's not just what you've written in the report, but it was your de the demeanor of President Biden as you interviewed him. I'll, I'll say in conclusion, whether he does or does not meet this definition, I believe your findings raise significant concerns about his current fitness for the office of the president and certainly his, current, his fitness going forward in the future. And I appreciate the fact that you were brazen enough to raise this issue in this report because you knew this would be significant in your findings, but you did so based on a very significant, very detailed, very thorough, independent report, and I praise you for that, uh, that doing your duty in such a way. Thank you, Special Counsel. I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back. Gentlemen from Virginia is recognized. I yield uh, to the chairman briefly. Uh, I think the gentleman for yielding, I'll just point out Mr. Ivey raised the issue of transcripts. He has complete access to every transcript that we have done in a congressional investigation. He can go, he could, he could show up for all the depositions, like, like frankly, I show up for most of those. Uh, so he has complete access to that. What we don't have is access to the transcripts of all the witnesses. We only have Mr. Biden, and we don't have access to the audio tapes of all the witnesses, will, which is will what Will the we're gentleman seeking. yield? It's not my time. I yield back to the gentleman from Virginia. You're speaking, but it's not your time? It's my time. You yield it to me. All right. I thank the gentleman. Uh, Special Counsel Hur, thank you for being here. Uh, your, your story is an impressive one. Your achievements are, are impressive as well. You've been a prosecutor for many years, correct? Yes, sir. Um, I was not a prosecutor for uh, more than a couple of years, but I still remember my uh, record in jury trials. Do you remember your record? It'll take me a little time to reconstruct, but I think I could get there. Is it above 500? Uh, it is above 500, yes, sir. Okay. Well, I, I'm curious because um, the evidence that you outline in your report is pretty significant when it comes to evidence that after his vice presidency, and I'm reading from your report, Mr. Biden willfully retained marked classified documents about <laughs> Afghanistan and unmarked classified handwritten notes in his notebooks, both of which he stored in unsecured places in his home. Uh, further, you noted that there's evidence that he willfully retained the classified Afghanistan documents, including the Thanksgiving memo, and had a strong motive to keep such classified documents. Um, you outline what that mo motive is. Can you tell me what, what is the motive for keeping the Thanksgiving Day memo? Uh, one of the motives that we addressed in the report was that the, the issue of whether or not a, a troop surge should be sent to Afghanistan in 2009 was a hotly contested and debated issue within the Obama administration back in 2009, and one in which um, then Vice President Biden uh, had a significant role and he felt very strongly about. I'm gonna quote from your report. Uh, President Biden believed President Obama's 2009 <coughs> troop surge was a mistake on par with Vietnam and wanted the record to show that he was right about Afghanistan, that his critics were wrong, and that he had opposed President Obama's mistaken decision forcefully when it was made, that his judgment was sound when it mattered most. Does that sound correct? That language sounds familiar from the report, yes. Okay. Um, that is, is pretty significant in terms of a motivating factor for retaining those documents, wouldn't you say? That would be a factor that a jury would assess in considering whether or not Mr. Biden had criminal intent. And. I also uh, know that uh, President Biden was working with a ghostwriter on a book, uh, Mark Zwanaker, uh, correct? Correct. And your investigation concluded when uh, President Biden began work on his memoir, correct? When did, at what time did your investigation conclude? With respect to the, the second book published in 2017, we identified evidence that Mr. Biden began recorded conversations with Mr. Zwanitzer in 2016 before the end of Mr. Biden's vice presidency. And it's your understanding that while Mr. Zwanitzer interviewed President Biden, he read classified information from his notebooks nearly verbatim, sometimes for an hour or more at a time, correct? Correct. And was Mr. Zwanitzer authorized to receive this classified information? He was not. And in fact, in their February 16th meeting, which has been alluded to earlier, isn't it true that President Biden read aloud and nearly verbatim uh, classified act information regarding the actions and views of U.S. military leaders and the CIA director relating to the foreign country and a foreign terrorist organization? 
I believe that occurred, that was captured in a recording later in 2017, I believe in April of 2017, not February. Okay, and Mr. Zwaniter became aware of your special, uh, your appointment as special counsel, correct? At some point, Mr. Zwaniter did become aware of my appointment, yes. And upon <clears throat> learning of the investigation, uh, Mr. Zwaniter deleted digital audio recordings of his conversations with Mr. Biden during the writing of the book, Promise Me Dad. Correct. Did investiga and investigators with your office interviewed Mr. Zwaniter about the deleted recordings, and he admitted that part of his motivation for deleting this recording was because he was aware there was an investigation, correct? Correct. And did this <clears throat> conduct raise concerns with your office? It did. We considered it to be a significant evidence that we needed to follow up on. Significant evidence, and I would argue that you also had significant evidence surrounding um, the retention of these documents, the storage of these documents, and even though there was a, um, a bit of a disconnect uh, between what a reasonable juror could conclude, uh, the intent was there, uh, the motive was there for the book, for exoneration, and I would argue that you had enough to move forward. Uh, my time has expired. I yield back. The gentleman from South Carolina is recognized. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield to you such time as you may consume, sir. Oh, I, I appreciate the gentleman yielding. Uh, Mr. Hur, why did, why did the White House go, why did the White House lawyers go look in the first place? My understanding is they went to the Penn Biden Center. Why did they go look in the first place? M my I mean, look for classified, you know, mishandling of classified, look for classified documents. Why did they do it? What we identified uh, through our investigation was that um, at a certain date, members of uh, the president's staff went to the Penn Biden Center in order to get a better handle on what the information, what kinds of evidence and uh, what, what kinds of materials were at the Penn Biden Center. Were they specifically looking for potential uh, documents that were classified or was it a broader initial look? My understanding is that it was a broader initial look and I'm looking at chapter 14, page 257 of my report about um, a visit in right. March 2021 right. to the Penn Biden Center. Okay. Uh, in March? In March of 2021. And was this after the uh, Justice Department began their investigation into President Trump? I confess I don't have the date of the beginning of the investigation into President Trump at hand, Chairman. I believe it was the same month. I mean, I believe it was after, uh, so I was just, just, just curious of that. Now, one other thing I think is important for folks to understand is President Biden had this information everywhere. You, you said they initially went to the Penn Biden Center. Which location was it at? Do you remember when they initially did their look? Was it at the transition office? Was it at the temporary Penn Biden Center in Chinatown? Or was that at its current location where the Penn Biden Center uh, currently sits here in uh, or, or, you know, final location, I guess, in D.C.? Do you remember? I believe the visit that I referenced in March 2021 that's described on page 257 was to the Penn, ben, Penn Biden Center's a permanent and current location. Permanent and current. So there were three places, those three places, classified information were, was at. Is that fair to say? That's correct. The initial transition office immediately after the end of the vice presidency, the Penn Biden Center's temporary office, and then the Penn Biden Center's permanent office. Okay. So those, and then you had the University of Delaware Library, the University of Delaware Biden Center, right? So that's five total. And then you had multiple places in his home. Correct. The garage, the den, the office upstairs and the office downstairs. Correct. So what is that? That's like nine different places. I've lost count, sir, but yeah, that exactly. sounds, that sounds it's, right. a, it's everywhere. And it was documents for over a 50 year time frame. And then by comparison, because the Democrats want to keep comparing to President, President Trump's classified document right at his home with Secret Service protection. I don't know that they're anywhere else, were they? Uh, I, I'm not aware of other locations, President. Yeah. I, think that, I think that's an important distinction. I would yield back to the gentleman for South Carolina. Appreciate him yielding. Thank you, Chairman. Um, briefly, I know we've got two minutes left, but um, Mr. Hur, how would you define willful? Uh, with respect to the, the intent um, of willfulness, what, what a jury has to conclude is that someone knew that their conduct was illegal when they engaged in that conduct. Right, it's, it's intentional, right? It's not by accident. It's not accidental or involuntary. Correct. Okay. So, so here's where I disagree with your portion of the report on willful is that you have a gentleman who served 36 years in the Senate. I've only been here a year, but I understand the, the importance of handling classified information. He served eight years as vice president. In 2010, it came to the attention of the vice president's staff that classified briefing books had not been returned. Even, even if they were, they were returned, some of the content was missing. The same year, the executive secretary 
raised that nearly 30 of the classified briefing books from the first six months of 2010 were missing. In August of that year, then Vice President Biden failed to return top secret, sensitive, compartment, uh, compartmented information contents of a classified briefing book from a trip that he took to the Hamptons. And to date, you were unable to determine if these documents were ever recovered, is that correct? Correct. So, so to me, this wasn't, when does willfulness as a, as a uh, when does willfulness factor in? Is it now in his diminished mental capacity, or is it then when he was serving as senator and vice president? A, a jury would be assessing um, President Biden's mental state and his intent, or whether or not he had willfulness, at the time that the conduct was committed. Correct, and I think everyone can kind of plainly see the, the, the transgression or the, the, the difference between then candidate Biden or Vice President Biden and, and what is going on now. And so this is where I, I go to it. As, as the chairman talked about in his opening comments, he had eight million reasons to, to, to hold these documents. In fact, he disclosed some of this information to uh, his ghostwriter. And so I think that there, there could have been willfulness. And I think, you know, I've got 10 seconds left, but look, since 2016, there have been three candidates to run for president. All three have had allegations of uh, issues surrounding the retention and holding of classified documents, but Mr. Herr, only one of them has been charged, and that's President Trump, and that's why people think and view this as a two-tiered system of justice. Thank you, sir. Gentleman yields back. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentleman from... Uh, Shield, you, you have unanimous I'll, consent? Yeah, I'll wait. Let him go ahead. The gentleman from Colorado, Mr. Buck. Thank you. Mr. Hur, they say they save the best for last, so Maybe I'm looking last. forward to this opportunity. Um, first of all, what I've observed in this hearing is that one side thinks you're trying to get President Trump elected, and the other side thinks you're trying to get President Biden elected. Um, I served as a prosecutor for 25 years. I know that you're going to take grief from both sides. You must be doing a great job in your report and during your investigation if you have convinced both sides that you are somewhere in the middle. I, uh, I commend you for your, um, your background. I, I would have loved to have met uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist. Um, what, a, what a hero to conservatives and, and really uh, Americans. And uh, that must have been a, a great opportunity for you. Um, but when both sides attack you, uh, my, my uh, admonition is uh, welcome to Congress. How many... Uh, I, I do have a question, um, and, and it goes along the lines of what Mr. Armstrong and, and Mr. Fry were asking you earlier. I, I'm really confused about uh, willfulness and, and your, your view of, of willfulness. It's, it's clear to me that, that uh, at the time, Vice President Biden uh, knew he had classified documents. He told his, uh, after he left the vice presidency, he told his biographer, um, uh, ghostwriter, um, uh, those classified documents are in the basement. <laughs> so he had the mental state that he had classified documents. He also knew that his basement was not a skiff. It is not a secure area. Um, and so uh, at the point, if, that, if at that point in time he said, oh my gosh, I've got to call the archivist, I've got to call uh, uh, Secret Service somebody and get these documents taken away, perhaps he has this uh, defense of, of acting as, as quickly as, as he knew about the documents. But I don't see where the willfulness is missing when he had those two. The element's pretty clear. Uh, he possessed classified documents. Um, he held them in a non-secure uh, area, and he did so knowingly. He, he knew he had classified documents in an unsecure area. What is, where is the willfulness missing? Well, sir, um, prosecutor to prosecutor, I, I certainly agree with you that the evidence in the form of the audio recorded statement where the president said to his ghostwriter, I just found all the classified stuff downstairs, that is evidence that that any prosecutor would, would present as significant evidence in a case if this went to trial. Um, so there, and reasonable jurors might well infer um, that, that President Biden formed criminal intent based on that piece of evidence. But what we did in our report was to try to walk through exhaustively, you know, you know well as a prosecutor, you need to um, assess with a, a very cold eye um, the strengths of your case and the weaknesses of your case and try to anticipate arguments that defense counsel might well present at trial. And what we tried to do in our report would be, was to walk through potential arguments that would be presented by defense lawyers at the president's trial 
and to determine how, by our judgment, how jurors would receive and perceive the evidence presented, including, including but not limited to, evidence relating to the president's memory gaps that were in various pieces of evidence that we assessed. So how do you overcome that recording where he says, I've got classified documents, he's 30 years in the Senate or whatever it is, he, he obviously knows how he has to treat classified documents, I've got classified documents in, in the basement. How, what is the defense to that? That, that it was a made-up recording? That, that it wasn't his voice? That uh, everyone was, was wrong? Um, how, how do you defend that, that particular fact? As well as, I did a lot of tax cases, you had to prove a, a, a pattern of conduct. And, and in this case, he had a lot of documents in a lot of places. How do you overcome those things? Yes, Congressman. So we walk through a number of different um, evidentiary gaps that reasonable jurors might focus on, as well as a number of different, different defense arguments that the president's defense lawyers could, president tr uh, could present at trial. The first is um, a theory or an argument to the jury that the president, yes, he did say to his ghostwriter, I just found all the classified stuff downstairs, but then soon thereafter forgot about the documents. And therefore, it would be difficult to convince a jury that actually he willfully he knew that it was illegal to keep the documents and he continued to do so. A second argument that we considered is that perhaps this do these documents never actually were in Virginia in his private rental home there. Perhaps the documents were there um, by virtue of staff or, or himself having those documents at the Delaware home from the time that he was still vice president all the way through the, the time of their being discovered. And, and finally, another theory that we walk through in the report is that there were two folders of marked classified documents relating to Afghanistan found in the box in the president's Delaware garage. One of them contained national defense information, and the other, uh, it would be a more difficult task to persuade a jury that it did contain national defense information. So that, it, that argument would be premised on perhaps the president was referring to the one folder that didn't contain national defense information but was not, it would be difficult for the government to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he possessed the one that did contain national defense information. So I, I just laid a lot on you there, but we do, we do our best to explain that at some length in the report. Thank you, I yield back. Gentleman yields uh, back. Mr. Mr. Chairman. General lady from Texas, recognize. I, I thank you. And there's been a lot of um, time being shared, Mr. Chairman. I ask your very brief indulgence. Um, wait, 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 wait. You got a unanimous consent or you asking a question? I, your brief indulgence on unanimous consent dash question. No, 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 no. You can, <laughs> you, can, you can do a unanimous consent request, but you don't get to get another round. Someone that comes to yield you time, but I don't think they can do that because everyone on the Democrat side has taken their time. How did you, I, how you, did, know, you know that I how did you appreciate the down? gentlelady from Texas, but yeah. you don't get to go two rounds. I'm not trying to go two rounds, but you let got me... a unanimous consent request you want in the record, state yeah. so. If not, then we're... I'm, I'm close getting ready here. to do the unanimous consent request, hoping that someone would come through the door. I ask unanimous consent... Well, we uh, could only be a Republican, because all the Democrats have spoken. I ask unanimous consent uh, that we add uh, to the record, as stated, uh, from page one of the executive summary, we conclude that no criminal charges are warranted in this matter. We would reach the same conclusion, even if... The Without Department objection. of Justice policy did not foreclose the criminal charges against the, the Senate president. I ask unanimous consent is. that that sentence be put in. And secondarily, I ask right. unanimous consent. Um, and a unanimous reference. consent to add something to the record that's already in the record. God bless you. We'll do it. Thank you. And I add, with the, with the emphasis of Sheila Jackson Lee, it does not have. And I uh, particularly uh, ask uh, that this be added to the record that Mr. Herr stated that Biden couldn't recall when his son Bo died. I add the unanimous consent out of an article in Politico and indicate that there was no mercy given to with, Mr. Biden and no mercy given to him in the decision of this Without objection, report. so entered. Mr. Hurd, even though there wasn't a question there, do you want to respond to any of that? No, Chairman. All right. Uh, Mr. Hurd, we want to thank you thank for you. being here today. Um, and uh, we wish the best to you and your family. This concludes today's hearing. We thank our witnesses for appearing before the committee today without objection. All members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witness or additional materials for the record. Without objection, the hearing is adjourned.